All right, welcome to the Krug Show, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great Saturday. It is February the 17th, 2024, 18 minutes after 9 on the West Coast. That means it's 1218 back east where the coach joins us. And, of course, we're brought to you by Pig and a Pickle, the best barbecue in all of Northern California. Check them out in Emeryville and Corte Madera. They're open seven days a week from 11 a.m. till 8 p.m. or until they run out. Pig and a Pickle. The best barbecue you're going to find in all of Northern California. We're also brought to you by Marin Auto Glass, 415-883-3030, marinautoglass.com, on the web. And, of course, Underdog Fantasy. Check the link in the description. Use the promo code KRUG, K-R-U-E-G, and they'll match you up to your first $100. And then we have two special sponsors this month for... um, our trip to Las Vegas, which we just finished during Super Bowl week. Sharp Corner Sports Cards and Collectibles. Uh, give Anthony Catania a call. He's in Pacific Grove, 831-521-5264. And ValleyHillRoofing.net, 209-481-6851. If you're looking for a roofing contractor, they're the best in Northern California. And the links to both of their websites are listed in the description. And if everybody could like and subscribe right here on the Krug Show and over on on Coach's Show, we would appreciate that greatly. Coach, good morning. How are you? My guy, it is finally good to get you back. You are a sight for sore eyes. How you doing, Larry? Oh, man. You know, this has been such a weird week, Coach, because, you know, I put everything I had into this season, man, everything. I mean, I grinded like nobody's business mini camp training camp draft videos um i mean i've been at this thing really i really kind of feel like since john lynch spoke at the combine last year right that this channel and this 49er youtube space let's just say that we're both in right just exploded that day Right, because that was the day where John came out and said, "Well, you know what? We really like Trey Lance, but that's the problem. We got a team that's ready to win right now." And mm-hmm. from there, I went with the they're going to trade Trey Lance and commit to Brock Purdy, and like from that minute on, you it is my just. Guy. It's just been on. I mean, it has been on. People attacking, people agreeing. Um, Come full circle, man. Man, we've hell of a ride. We've. I mean, seriously, that whole like literally that was February, and then they traded Trey in August. So think about that: February, March, April, May, June, July, and almost all of August. Seven months of. Who's going to be the quarterback? Is it Trey? Is it Brock? Is it going to be? Is it going to be somebody else? Are they going to trade Trey? Are they going to? Is he going to fight for the job? Is he? Where's Darnold in the mix? Now they signed Brandon Allen. Uh, who looks better in camp? Um, oh my God! All the way into now, Trey's a cowboy. So mm-hmm. I mean, normally coach this would be like a grind of a season right because it goes to the very end but um in a lot of ways this seems like the long the end of the longest buildup ever and um and i i gotta be honest i mean coming back from vegas and having lost you know well coming back from vegas we came back on saturday so we hadn't lost yet coming back from vegas was was you know i don't know if i could have made that drive after the game Luckily, I, I drove Saturday, um, but just just recapping Saturday, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, here we are, it's Saturday. I've just been in a fog, and I've been in this kind of like... Uh, just trying to decompress. Yeah, decompress. I wouldn't call it depression because it's like I got too many other things going on with kids and family and wife and the whole deal. I can't... You know, I'm not in that mode where I'm just like, oh, I'm depressed. I'm not depressed. But, man, it's like this has had my singular focus sports-wise. I put the Giants and the Warriors kind of aside and just focused from literally February to a, for an entire calendar year on the 49ers and um, got to the winner's circle and was standing right on the outside 
of the perimeter to the winner's circle and mm -hmm. only to come short, fall short once again. And it's just a, oh, you know, it's kind of like one of those, I, I yeah. don't know. Where, where are yeah. you? Uh, I'm tired. Uh, I'm worn out. Um, you know, uh, I feel like, um, I've been like expressing kind of like my disdain for the season on Twitter. I've kind of, that's kind of been like my little emotional outlet over the past couple of days. So, uh, there's a bevy of emotions that I've been going through. Um, I'm proud of, I'm proud of the season because there's only two teams on in the NFL that get to complain about how they performed in the Super Bowl. So you gotta, these are first world problems that we haven't, you know what I mean? So sure. you gotta keep things in perspective. So there's that. So you got to go outside and touch grass every once in a while. But um, as far as like in a vacuum, um, I think if I had to, you know, we're going to talk about everything. But I think if I had to like, you know, in a nutshell, tell you how I feel is that we didn't get beat by a better team. They were just more prepared than us. We lost in preparation. We lost in attitude. We lost in decision making. Um, we just lost in all of the things that you can't see. Um, we got a chance to see them in the raw. And you, if we'd have saw this stuff before the playoffs, we'd have been talking about this stuff. You know what I mean? But um, that's why I just was upset like I, losing is losing you know somebody's got to win somebody's got to lose sure but it's the way we lost that just doesn't sit right with me and the the fallout and to see like the defense of the team is kind of like it's a little weird because it's like what is this north korea like it's okay to say that we didn't do what we expected to do but um it's a little uh, discouraging, to be well, honest with you. How would you say the way it ended or how it ended? What yeah. about how it ended bothered you the most? I mean, obviously, well, we everybody get into knows. The OT stuff. Niners lost in overtime. Yeah. Um, how it ended with me was, um, was it, just was with it Kyle. The uh, strategy what, in overtime, you mean? Yeah. Well, not only the strategy with overtime, but let's just go. Uh, let's go with the uh, the the third down play that um, we got the blitz um, consistently, man. Uh, they were, they were playing man zero coverage against us for most of the game. They started out in two, co two man, two man cover high. I mean, two, two man high cover two. And uh, it wasn't working. We were gashing them in the middle and then they went into man. They started going into man and, you know, even going to, into one high and dropping that six man in the box. And what they were really doing is they were overloading the front and forcing everything back, either with Chris Jones um, on the backside or forcing it back into DB. So they usually were overloaded with DBs on the front and have Chris Jones on the back. And I just felt like that just kept happening. Like I was saying run the ball, but he just wasn't creative with running the ball. He only ran the ball one way. And if it didn't work, uh, then, you know, it was just, oh, well, the run's not working. And it's just like, you know, how many tunnel screens did we see in this game? You know, how many, that's what I was looking for Debo to see, Debo to do in this game. How many end arounds with Debo did we see? You know, Debo catching short intermediate passes is cool, but once they started going, man, Debo is not a natural route runner. He's got a, he's got a very limited release package and you just saw him, you know, Debo got like 11, 14 targets in this game. Hold on, I just want to be accurate. Um, where, where is his? Uh, it was an awful lot for a guy who's pretty hurt, from what I got could tell. Tons of targets, man. It's just like you know, even on um putting Debo down, uh, getting getting Brandon Ayuk on the outside at all times. It's just like you know, those are some of the things that just show that this this team and this offense is incredibly schemed up. 
but they can't contemporaneously feel the game flow and make things happen. Like I didn't feel like there was any situational awareness where we put the ball in Debo's hands or we put the ball in Brandon Ayuk's hands purposefully, right? For what the game called for at that moment. Um, we weren't creative with running the ball. Uh, we didn't, I, I saw a little flash where I thought that Elijah Mitchell was going to start getting the ball a little bit more. We're going to start using him on the inside. Then he immediately went, went away from it. Uh, with Christian McCaffrey, I just felt as though that a lot of the yards that Christian McCaffrey was getting, particularly through the air, was just a byproduct over the fact that Debo was not getting open. So Christian was a, was the third option on on a lot of these passes. Um, offensive line, um, we didn't. You know, everybody knows that our offensive line struggles. Um, me and you talked about it. I called you. Did, I, did we spoke on the phone? What we talk about? You asked me directly. Anybody who's a fan of this show. They know Larry and I have talked about this. What was the question? If there was a reason why we lost the Super Bowl, what would it be? Offensive line. I said it flat out. And for me, pound for pound, they struggle. I get that. But not putting them in the right position structurally is what frustrated me. It just wasn't sound. Why are we pulling the center? OK, just to just to activate game flow for the play action like that's that's auxiliary. That's all. Aus- that's aesthetic. That's trying to get somebody off of their square. But that's not sound. That's not protecting Brock. That's not putting your offensive line in the best position to do their job. They already going against a D line that's better than them in the first place. You're going to start displacing them and making them go to different gaps for what? For a look, for the play to look a certain way, tell me the functional reason why you're pulling centers in the goal line. We're going five wide on the goal line, Larry, and we're using play action and shotgun. But it's Spencer <laughs> Burford's fault that he's got to pick between paint on his inside and a free rusher on his outside. But Kyle's a genius. Then you get guys getting all over the place. Oh, you don't know football. Kyle doesn't need to be held accountable. It's bullshit, man. You're seeing all of this window dressing put all over the offense, and these boys are put, being put in the best position to succeed. Damn, That's coach. why it hurts. That's Co- why it hurts. Coach is letting, letting it out, letting it out. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I, I I didn't there were several elements of the plan I, I didn't uh, I didn't like um, but on the one hand you know there's 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 certain things that Kansas City was just more talented at and took away and that I can't blame Kyle for but then there's other things that I can um, what what I felt like I don't did you see the baldy hour sit down with Spagnola no it's really good. It's really good, and and only because it's Spags, right? And so you get in, and and he loves Baldy and this guy uh, Gargano, and so he went on their podcast and he talked pretty openly about uh, just about this game and about what their plan was. And he said, you know, the number one goal for the Chiefs in this game was they felt like if Kyle established McCaffrey in the ground game, that if they couldn't stop it. That he would just the stay game with was over. That he would just stay with it all day. And so let me Larry, I have to chime in. I gotta chime in. Football is not rocket science. And whoever tries to talk to you like it is, don't know shit. <laughs> if there's anybody talking to you about football like it's complicated and they want to start putting all of these bells and whistles around it and start using terminology that they ain't never fucking heard of in their life, they don't know shit. It's a defense mechanism. They're hiding. If you can't teach something to a child, then you ain't an expert. Proof. You should be able to teach it to the lowest common denominator. If you can't do that, then you don't know ball. It isn't all that complicated. It really isn't. Though, you know, it can sound complicated when people get into the breakdown. But it's all basic, right? Offensive football creates space. Precision, timing, defensive football, accountability, effort, closed space. That's it. That's it. The rest of it is bells and whistles. But um, <clears throat> Spags mentioned that they really didn't have a solution for Kittle. That really 
that their goal that it's very difficult to take both the tight end out of the offense and the stop the run. Um, but he said, thanks to our personnel, we have Legereus Sneed and we have Trent McDuffie, and we matched up McDuffie on Ayuk, or we matched up a Sneed on Ayuk, and felt really good about that matchup all day. And then we put Trent on Debo. And he said that was the secret ingredients to everything that we do and everything that we did. It's just we had the ability to play man um, against the Niner wide receivers, and and we won. I mean, it was really that simple. And and you know, I don't know about Debo's health in this game because he wasn't healthy, obviously, in that Green Bay game, which was just a couple games before. I was surprised that the Niners went to Debo and at McDuffie who was an all-pro despite not having one interception. I mean, think about that. You're an all-pro nickelback. You didn't have one pick. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you that his coverage ability Anybody is just second to, to none. Yeah. I mean, he's a, he's an awesome cover guy. He was a first-round pick for a reason, and he, and he absolutely blanketed Debo. And he said that, you know, um, Spags was like, hey, look, the 49ers went to max protect in the first half to try to give Brock, you know, a clean pocket and they and he took some shots down the field and one of them was the deep ball touchdown that was just a perfect dime to Debo and McDuffie just made a great play. I mean that McDuffie was against, That was against that, man coverage. That was zero. That was zero. All right, there there's no like there were so many instances where the Chiefs were just saying, you know, we're just trusting. You know, we're going to play. We're going to play man on. He got to get open. He got to yeah. get open, and, and but, he just didn't win. I mean, and, and they did some other things too. I mean, they obviously they knew that Purdy could scramble, and they saw it in the in the film leading up. And he's like, we were very concerned about Purdy's scrambling ability, um, but then we just put Willie Gay and kind of spied him a little bit and made sure that Willie Gay, if he saw him take off, would close it off. And he did on one play where he where he yeah, stopped Purdy. Mean- but we already knew we already knew that Brock. I didn't expect Brock to have a big day on the ground. I mean, Brock had a great game, by the way. Like he, he was fine. He, he he missed a lot. He missed a lot. He pressed a lot. But considering the fact of what he was seeing out there, I ain't mad at him. Brock, there's really not much you can say about Brock outside of where he is in his career and what you expected out of him in the biggest game of his life. Brock, oh, did no, I mean, fine. He, oh, he did there's fine. There's nothing I mean, you could say about Brock. He he. Um, that if, if anything, if you wanted to say the positive of the Super Bowl in the loss was that it was clear to everybody who watched it wasn't too big for him. That the moment wasn't too big. And he was gonna and he played with poise. He got he took a hit on the chin from Nick Bolton. He was not flustered. Um he was not deterred. He he played a decent game. Mm-hmm. Um and then I thought it was also interesting how one of the uh, one of the adjustments that Spag said he made was they were you know when they blitzed Leo Chennault, the Wisconsin kid they were blitzing him off the edge that was the plan but they felt like the Niners struggled in the B gaps and so they started sending him in the B gaps he said that was effective mm-hmm. so and then and then also I thought it was really interesting listening to Spags talk about it Kansas City's backup wide receiver coach went through all of the Niners' gadget plays that Kyle had used in the last year and a half, and they actually worked on the same gadget play that the Niners executed, excuse me, executed uh, to uh, Juwan, or Juwan through the touchdown pass. Mm-hmm. He's like, we actually ran through that in practice twice this week trying to defend it, and he's like, we almost defended it. McDuffie almost made it a play on the ball. But it was a well coordinated play by Kyle and and but I mean just Spencer that just Herford goes had an amazing block on that play too. Yeah, yes he did. Yes he did. I was just gonna mention that. Um and also just the 49ers, the timing of that, you know, the timing was just right. Just right. Um and then, you know, he talked a little bit about, you know, how how, you know, that Kansas City in his mind, he's been around for a long time. He says Kansas City's defense this year is the highest IQ defense he's ever had. He said, you know, just across the board, we got really, really smart defensive players. Um, he meant he, he called out Mike Pinnell up front for being a dominant force in this game. game in he his said, life. 
said he was really key in the playoff run once Derek Noddy went out, uh, that Pennell, uh, Mike Pennell, was incredibly strong at the point. And then he he ch- he also, uh, you know, singled out Leo Chennault. He said, you know, he, he played a lot of, in the base this year, but the guy's smart as hell, really strong, loves football, and, um, you know, they did a Zoom, I guess, during the draft process when he came out and just fell in love with that kid. Singled out Drew Tranquil as a key to their success. And then at one point he just said, you know what, got Baldy, you know, all this stuff, what we did and they didn't do. He's like, at the end of the day, thank God we have Patrick Mahomes. He says he just has that inner confidence to make plays. He says Reed lets his coach his coach, and Mahomes is the difference maker. And um, and then, you know, it's funny that Baldy led him right to water about ripping Kyle on the OT decision making. He said, what were you what were you uh, uh, hoping San Francisco or what were you expecting San Francisco to do? And he dodged that question, man, so much. He's like <clears throat> he was like, hey, man, I just wanted to know, you know, either we're 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 going on defense or. Or, you know, we're going to sit here and watch Patrick. You know, so he looked at it solely. He tried, from tried to, yeah, he tried yeah. to make it look like he was literally in the stands with us. Or 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 also, like, you know, like it, there was no real right or wrong decision. That it was, you know, it's just like you do what you do and, you know, we react. Um, but and then and then uh, Spag said he'd like to be a head coach again. And he crit- he compliment- complimented uh, Shannon. No, no, he doesn't. He says he did. He says he does. Well, we'll see. No, he does it. Why? I mean, Why? He, he he may get an opportunity again because the way Why would he, how he want good to do he's... that again. Well, I, I don't. I mean, I I agree. Uh, but um, it's not like being a head coach in college football where you're an executive and you're recruiting. It's still football, except you can your the buck stops with you. I mean, I imagine that when Andy decides to hang it up, that he's going to be the replacement. Uh, some people think it's naggy, but I don't. I, th- I think it'll probably be um, be Spagnolo. But yes, I'll say this about Spagnolo: he's got four. He's got four rings, four rings as a coordinator or a head coach. So um, you know the guy's done a really, really good job. What I let's get to the overtime decision because Shanahan played it like it was the regular season. Other people claim afterwards, at his presser when he described it, he said, we wanted the ball third. When John Lynch was sitting with him and he's talking to the media, John emphasized that the defense was tired. The defense being tired is really the only reasonable excuse for why you why you would you know um, take the ball first. Um, and Kyle, and for for the record, Kyle denied that the defense was tired when he was asked about it on after the game directly. He said it didn't have anything to do with the te- defense being fatigued. Yeah, so I don't like that decision. You know, yeah. um, I'd rather have three downs and the question mark as opposed to trying to defend Mahomes for four downs when he knows the what he needs. I, I just. I didn't like that. I don't know that it was going to work either way, Coach. To be completely honest, because who knows? It's it's still you're still talking about Mahomes, and and he still drove the length of, of the field. And are you tell me you wouldn't have dri- driven the length of the field if they had started with the ball. I don't know. I don't know. I get the well, feeling they, there's they a were, couple of things that are, they there, lost some it. Flaws. They lost it when they couldn't find Ayuk and score the touchdown. Um, themselves in overtime. That was a crusher because well, you just kind of felt like. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I I never felt good watching the Niners kick that field goal. There was no celebration at all. I was like, eh, okay, you know, let's see. You know, let's once again because you. I think you asked me the question last week. Would you rather be down and and um, have the ball with a chance to beat Mahomes, or would you rather be up and he's got the ball with a he's chance to beat ball. you? I should, yes. And I said I'd rather be down with down. the ball with the ball. And so now the Niners were up, but they didn't have the ball. So you know. uh, and even during that, uh, if you look at during that play, um, when we kicked that field goal, um, a player from the Chiefs, uh, you know, they had the mic'd up uh, on the NFL Network. Uh, I haven't. Se- I taped it last night. I haven't seen it yet. It's on the, Well, uh, I think uh, the NFL has it on their YouTube channel. You can watch it there. 
Um, but you know, is, isn't it not to interrupt you? Sorry, coach, but isn't it interesting how live Mike provides so many details that you don't get on TV that it's like when I watch the live Mike, I think to myself, someday we're going to watch this live with live Mike. And I, I know there's swearing and there's filtering and there's editing right. and there's things that, that nobody wants to get out, but the money will be so great that I think if you, you know, fast forward 25 years, 30 years when uh, the sport's still popular and maybe more popular than it even is today, mm -hmm. I could picture live Mike in the broadcast being, you know, being a regular occurrence and how that would just explode our viewing experience and and make suddenly the the couch you know now the i still think the couch uh, experience is bigger is better than the stadium experience right now but if you want to make it a freaking slam dunk just have a bunch of people in the stands you know getting what they normally get and now give the people on the couch live audio of the field and then suddenly it's like, dude, the the, ca the couch experience is going to be like 10 times better than the stadium. I mean, experience. pretty soon they're going to have like a quarterback cam where it's going to be attached to his helmet. And you're going to be able to actually see what he was looking at through his progressions. It's coming. It's yeah. all coming. They're about to start putting like film on the field. They're going to start putting cameras on these boys. They're already putting mics on them. So they're going to start putting cameras on them. like a GoPro. You mean like something mm -hmm. up here? Yeah. Something that Christian probably like mounted Christian McCaffrey. Christian or, McCaffrey cam, you can see him juking somebody. Nah, or if you are, uh, they've already got the technology. If you're familiar with Guy Udet University, it's out here in DC. It's the okay. uh, school for the um, hearing impaired. Okay. And Guy Udet, they have cameras on the inside of their helmet uh, where it puts out like almost like a little plastic glass lens over their eye. And it puts out the plays and everything for the players inside of their helmets. So they already use that technology with Guy Udet University. So it's coming. They they just have to optimize it. Somebody has said in the chat that my mic is a little too hot, so I'm going to try to turn it down here. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Let's see if I can um, get it. But uh, for me, one of the uh, one of the uh, players. From the Chiefs looked over at one of our guys after we kicked that field goal and he said, You think that's gonna be enough? That ain't enough. That field goal ain't enough. Um, they are it, it's there's so many little things in that being able to hear, you can tell. Like Trent Williams, uh, he was nervous. I mean, we saw it in his play, we saw how he started, but I listened to how he talked. He wasn't talking with confidence. He was freaked out the entire time. He was nervous, right? Alert the pressure. Oh, man, I knew we were going to get. I was just like, man, man up. We're trying to win, bro. Like I, you, you, the, uh, the back and forth from uh, George, the hey, George, like, my oh. God. Uh, like, dude, what are you? Par for the course, man. Par for the course. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way to really even, like, bring that up. Like, there's people trying to pour water on that. Like, that's not a big deal. Man, you never play sports competitively if that's not a big deal to you. You've never been on the field. You've never been in a position where, man, in order for you to talk on the field, you got to be the shit. That's how I grew up. You had to be nice, even to let your coach let you talk on the field, to let you talk. And for you to be talking, and even if you talk, you talked in between plays. In between, you talking during the play? I know, I know that was, and it's like, <clears throat> it's all. It's great that he's glib, and it's great that he has fun with it. And God bless George Kittle, but you know, he got he got his comeuppance right there. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's perfect for a guy like him for that to happen. It's like, you want the camera, you want the mic, you want the shine. Now you got it. Yeah. Now you got it. And we got you saying your own name. That's the irony. The irony is, is that you would think you were talking to George Karloftis. George Karloftis was too busy trying to get back into the play. You were talking to yourself, brother. 
You weren't paying attention. And for those who say, oh, well, he got him out of the play. Dude, you play to the echo of the whistle. There's only two options that you have on that play. Either you put his ass in the dirt and put take him completely out of the play, which is off the field, or you realize that you've got him out of your gap and you look upfield and start searching for trash. Ergo, either you get the ball looking for trash or you push him out. And that's that's what adds injury to insult. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. But what adds injury to insult is it was your man that recovered the fumble. Oh, I know. It was and your you, man. And you were talking to him and the whistle hadn't blown. And you got to play to the whistle. And it's the Super Bowl. And yeah, I mean, he just, I mean, I bet you that it's is a the bad hardest. No, no consequences should come from it. Nothing at all, but it's just it's just a black eye. That's all it is. Yeah. It just it hurts. It was bad. It was yeah, really it was bad. just bad. That's all. No, no, no. We should get rid of George because of it. Not, not none of that. But for you not to act like that wasn't a big deal just shows how cucked you really are. That was a big <laughs> deal, man. Don't yeah. be cucked. Well, it was I a mean, big deal. it's okay you know, to say it was a big deal. People were like, "Well, his, are you blaming George? His his back was turned." Yeah, I'm blaming George for for not going to the whistle. I mean, there was no whistle there. Right. So keep keep blocking your man, keep being aware, keep playing the game, stay in character. Uh, you know, that's that's what I'm, I mean. That's really what we're talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. um, he lost focus there. Maybe it's nervousness. Maybe it was the magnitude of the game. It's a defense uh, mechanism. I love it's, George. It's, though. Come I mean, on. And jo George is a tough football player. George is a really great football player, but he made a mistake. He made a mistake. Yeah, it was just a um, it was a mistake. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. And, um, you know, he would own it. That's the one thing about George that I really love is that if George were sitting here, he could handle this conversation. He could sit here and listen to me or coach or any of you kind of rip him. And he would say, hey, man, I got to own it. I I blew that. I blew that. I can't be talking to him there until I hear the whistle. And, um, you know, I blew that play and that one's on me. I should have recovered that fumble. Um, I'm the reason that, you know, I'm, I'm not the reason that, that he recovered the fumble, but he kept playing and I stopped. So, mm -hmm. and that's what I love about George. He wouldn't dodge. He wouldn't dodge. Uh, let's hit these supers because I don't want to get them too backed up here. Yaz Williams says, coach. When are your supers going to start to work in March next month, March, uh, Kent says, who's your dream pick for defensive coordinator? Why don't you Robert Sala. Is he going to get fired? I mean, I would like him to. I'm sorry, Robert. <laughs> but uh, um, I think uh, I, I saw think somebody else. Somebody else said that they're waiting around for Sala to get fired. I could understand that, but I I haven't heard any. It wouldn't if that was going to happen. Wouldn't have already happened. Yeah, it's definitely not happening this year. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Like there are, I mean, some, there are some bigger names. Of course, you know, we're going to talk about your boy, Bill Belichick. Uh, yeah, that's my, that's there. the guy that I want. Yeah. And that, that's a viable, that's a viable choice actually, Larry. Um, if he it, was, a, if he, if he was up to it, but I, I like mean, it's Mike a great, Vrabel. it's an awesome choice if he's up to it. Yeah. I, I mean, like Mike Vrabel. Yeah. I like, Vrabel. um, uh, I also like uh, Coach Lynn's kid. I forgot his name. Coach Lynn, his kid is a real big uh, – his kid is making a lot of strides as a defensive coordinator in college football. Um, he's doing very well. I wouldn't mind them giving him a shot. Um, but ultimately, Larry, um, if you just look at the track and kind of back up from, I want to say, Coach Sala on – uh, the Niners are pretty much preserving what they already have on defense and not really interested in anybody coming in and starting something new, right? I can't see this team moving on from Coach Kasarik, um, Coach Holland, um, some of the guys that they really like here. And, you know, I think we really saw just how staunch they are to keeping guys on their defense as far as the coaching staff is concerned, with Coach Wilkes being here because he was kind of like the first outside guy to come in here in a while. And when you look at that, you have to ask yourself real questions like, 
well, is Coach Belichick going to be told that he has to learn this defense and he can't bring in his own staff? I don't think that's going to happen. Right. Uh, I don't think that's happening with Mike Vrabel. I don't think that's happening with a Pete Carroll. Right. Like some of your more um, established guys. I don't see that happening. So uh, it's clear that uh, Nick Bosa and the defensive line in that defense, that linebacking core specifically, they're really galvanized or making sure that they stay together and that they keep things a certain way. Um, we saw that all year with Coach Wilkes. So it does shape my expectations rather on who we might get. And the only reason why I say that is because I do believe that it's probably going to be Bullocks or Sorensen, um, the pass game coordinator that's already there. Uh, they're going to try to keep it in house. Even when they fired coach Wilkes, I don't realize that Kyle understood what he was saying, but he was making it pretty clear. He was saying, you know, he was an outside guy, like saying that a coach was an outside guy is pretty damning. You know, um, and that it was going to take him a while to uh, we already knew that it was going to be hard to be a fit. But for me, I I look at Coach Wilkes coming in with making we were at 18. We are 19 points a year, um, 19 points a game last year. We finished with 17 points a game last year and we lost seven. We lost seven. Uh, we lost seven contributors on defense last year. We lost uh, Jordan Willis. We lost Hassan Ridgeway. We lost uh, uh, Jimmy Ward. We lost Samson Ecubom. We lost Charger Mini, Charles Aminihu. Um, I mean, we lost a lot of guys Aziz. that contributed on Aziz Al Shair. We lost a lot of guys that uh, contributed on our defense on a regular basis, and we were already number one. So really, there was we were trying. There was really nowhere else to go. But the fact that he came through and actually, and he came here, I feel like sometimes we move the goalposts. But Coach Wilkes was brought in here to improve our secondary. That's what Coach Wilkes was brought in here for, and he did that. We led the league in takeovers. I mean, in turnovers this year, in picks. Um, and we saw the emergence of De the emergence of Diamador Lenore at some point. At sometimes during the season, we had Ambry Thomas playing in good stretches, and Charles uh, Traverius Ward became an All Pro and a first team All Pro here. Um, so for me, uh, I think that Coach Wilkes was more of a fit. Uh, lack of fit is the reason why he got let go, uh, but. I also believe how he got let go um, shows that it's going to be kind of hard to see the Niners really bringing somebody in from the outside. Like they're pretty staunch on uh, what they want as far as the players. I think that was a really big thing with Coach Wilkes is that Nick Bosa, the linebacking core, they had an issue with how he was running the defense. I mean, it's already widely known that, uh, Fred Warner was one of the most vocal guys on the defense that wanted Coach Wilkes out of the booth and back on the sidelines during games. So, I mean, they twisted this guy up like a pretzel. I think for this, for these guys, it's clear that our defense is ran by our players um, and they're going to make sure. I think that Kyle isn't going to make the mistake of bringing in another outside guy to, you know, basically have his players upset with them because I feel like they blamed Kyle for bringing in Wilkes and it not being a fit. And uh, that's one of the reasons why he's gone. So I think the next guy is going to be an inside guy. It's probably going to be Bullocks or Sorensen. You know, it's interesting. Those guys are so lacking in experience. I don't know about that. I mean, I they're big I, on Bullocks though. They love him. They talk about how oh, I know, uh, but he has no experience. He has no experience. He's never coordinated before. I don't know that you can run Wilkes out and just bring in somebody who's never, never done it. Kyle did say, "Hey, look, you know." We like our scheme, but I'm willing to run a different scheme if we get the right guy. So right. I'm, I, I think he probably said that with somebody in mind. Vrabel runs a three three five type, almost like a West Virginia uh, defense, but maybe yeah. that's based on his talent that he has. I don't know if he would go to a three three five here. Belichick's done a lot of three four. He's done it all. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, he's done it. He also has done it all, right? He's also gone four three, and and if there's anybody that could really, you know, stay with Chris Kasarek in the wide nine and still be great, it'd be Coach Belichick, probably Belichick. Um, a lot of people felt like Steve was scapegoated. I don't know if he was scapegoated to me because the one thing to me, the criminal mistake that you can make when you're the coordinator and you're 
And I asked Steve in October, I said, Steve, who's dialing up the games up front? Is it Chris or is it you? And he's like, no, I'm doing all that. Okay, so he's the guy dialing up the fronts, and he's the guy you know, deciding what coverage they're going to play on the back end. So it's a Steve Wilkes show. And for, this, for it to be a Steve Wilkes show and them to be as consistently not in sync front to back is, is negligence, major negligence. Um, it happened all day in the Cincinnati game where they tried to speed up Joe Burrow at times, and yet they played soft coverage behind. If you're going to pl- speed up the quarterback and blitz, you, your, court, your, your coverage has got to be coordinated. you got to play on time. You can't play a soft coverage and, and speed up the quarterback. It just it doesn't work, and it didn't work. It didn't work against Minnesota. Obviously, the zero blitz that caused Jordan Addison to score a touchdown at the end of the second quarter in the Minnesota game was a huge gaffe. I knew then, though, that, that Steve Wilkes was done at the end of the year because Shanahan threw him under the bus. I mean, you don't hear head coaches go to the podium and say, yeah, this guy screwed this up. And that's what he did. He said, Steve screwed this up. And right then I was like, oh, wow. I mean, there's there's not a lot of warmth there. There's not a lot of trust there. Nobody's covering anybody. So that was one. Then when I saw the Minnesota, the uh, the the uh, Cincinnati game where the coverage and the rush were not linked together, and then and then watching the Niners' run D just get gashed in the playoffs, worse than they really did, and and the speed at which some of those defenders were playing, uh, Steve gave me such the dirty look when I when the day after I asked Shanahan about uh, Chase Young not going hard. And I'm not sure if he was unhappy with Chase Young not going hard or unhappy with the dialogue that Chase Young wasn't going hard being bandied about. But they didn't say anything until after Shanahan was like, this is not our culture. And then the media kind of glummed onto it. The next day, Lynch is like, hey, we had a talk. That can't happen here. It's unacceptable. It, you know, uh, Effort is non-negotiable, so on and so forth. And then Steve came out and said, I was embarrassed. Um, and I just kind of felt like, okay, you can, that's owning it, but it's also on your watch. You know what I mean? It's like that, that was the unbelievable moment. I mean, I, I had Steve young on the show. I'm like, Steve, what'd you think of that? He's like, I couldn't believe what I was watching. It's the NFC championship game. And you got guys not going hard on the back end. So I don't know why. I I don't, I mean, uh, I don't know why if, if, if it was, if it, it wasn't was Javon just Hargraves, like, like this is the thing that's kind of crazy to me. This is this is twofold, and I'm gonna just stick with the effort issue. What's crazy to me is that I kind of feel like if anybody is the poster child for the lack of effort of the defense, it is Chase Young. But it's Chase Young in a sense that he's the first one that made us start looking at everybody else with effort issues as well. Because he wasn't the only one. Okay. Like, I feel like you do what you can to get when you when you want to get away with it. Like when in Rome. And I feel like Chase Young, he is not good enough to play half-assed and to barely get to barely chase down rushers on the backside and to not and not pile on and not finish on group tackling. But that has been happening across our entire defense. And you know what else? He did that. And we're sitting here talking about it's the coach's issue. But where the hell is Nick Bosa? That's supposed to be goddamn his mentor, his big brother. Where's where's Fred Warner? Where is these guys that are supposed to carry out this defense? They're too busy having effort issues as well. Like, this is what kills me about this. What kills me is that I could see if this was a traditional setup where Coach Wilkes came in, he brought in his coaches, they're running his defense. He gets a chance to sit there and explain to these guys why this element of the defense is so hard. What type of what type of spirit you're supposed to be using this technique with this defense? This is why I call these blitzes. But this ain't his defense. He's learning this defense. These boys are supposed to already have that shit built in. All right. So the effort issues like this is what's wild. 
if we're really going to say that the effort issues is a coaching problem and that's on Coach Wilkes, then that's on Kyle. Because how in the hell can you go into a Super Bowl and the keys to and the keys to the game are defensive stamina and effort? Well, I mean, it's it's all on Kyle, but it also it wasn't just Chase Young, Givens and others were not going hard. And and you know what? I don't want to hear any more talk about this wasn't Steve's defense. Steve is a big boy. Steve took this job. He had plenty of time to get familiar with this defense. It wasn't his defense when he took the job, but right. by the time he had plenty the play- of time to get familiar with this by, defense while Nick by, Bosa was going through a contract negotiation. But by right. but by, a lot by of the time. time training camp rolled around, he should have had this defense. It can't be both. It can't be super simple and super complicated. It either is simple or it's complicated. And it is simple. Steve, yeah, so so Steve Wilkes is responsible for the defense this year. Whether he it's his defense or not, he you can hold his feet to the fire on the production of his of this defense because it isn't that complicated and he had an entire offseason. He didn't have to take the job. Nobody nobody had a gun to his head and said, You have to take this job. He didn't have to take the job. This is an, an enormously talented defense. Um, and they had good coaches on all three levels. I mean, they, you know, Bullock's a good coach. Holland's a good coach. Kaserik's a good coach. Um, it's all falls on Shanahan, of course, because he's the head coach. So absolutely, you're right about that. I'm just saying that the effort, which was not just a Chase Young thing, but that's, come on, man. I mean, that, that, the, you know, the coordinator has to take some responsibility for the effort and the defensive coaches. Well, he's gone. Yeah, now he's gone. Um, but the other thing that I think has to be pointed out here is that go look at Steve's, you know, um, resume. Steve's coach for 25 years, he's had 22 different stops in 25 years. So it's not like he's normally a guy that stays for 5, 10 years. This guy's pattern is that he's here, he's here, he's here, he's there, and he's moved around a lot. Some of it has been come, come up because of promotion, I'm sure, but it's not all because of promotion. He's He either wears guys out or likes to move or whatever. Um, but to me, the lack of effort is, is bad. But the worst one is when you're calling the games up front, you're calling the coverages on the back end, and they don't match up. And then, to me, when Shanahan called the timeout in the Super Bowl and was like, you could see him yelling on the headsets, and you know he was yelling at Wilkes about the about probably a zero coverage. Um, you know, they didn't see eye to eye on on you know a number of fundamental football things. So um, it didn't surprise me that Steve is moving on. Let's just say that I was asked about it last week. Um, do you think Steve's moving on? I said, yeah, I absolutely think Steve's moving on. One, just because I don't think Kyle's really happy. Two, because um, was what I said. I, I don't think the coverage matched the uh, matched the the plan up front, and that's like the prerequisite for the job. Is your coverage, whatever you're doing up front, it's got to match what you're doing on the back end. Uh, you can't take all these chances up front and have a soft back end. Um, and, and there was times pause, this year Larry. where they did that. What happened? I said, pause, pause. What <laughs> Oh, you say you can't have a soft back end. Oh, oh, I got you. Well, but you know what I'm saying? You can't continue. You, you're good. you can't have, you can't have uh, a situation where you're playing loose coverage off man coverage and giving room up front and then trying to speed up the quarterback. I mean, the ball's going to come out. And guess what? It's going to be completed. And that's what mm-hmm. happened in that Cincinnati game. He just they they literally brought heat on Burrow and played soft coverage behind and he just played pitch and catch with his receivers all day. And it was like I've never seen it was like no resistance at all from the defense. So, I don't know. Um Wilkes is obviously a big topic this week. Let me just ask you this. Because you love to do the hypotheticals. Yeah. If I would have told you that the Niners going into the Super Bowl 
We're going to hold Patrick Mahomes to 19 points regulation. Yeah, but it's, it's not. You, you, but, every, oh, don't you, let me finish. But, don't let me. Come no, on. But I hear you. Come on. I hear you, don't coach, but it's not about the Super Bowl. Why can't I finish? You're just why making it a referendum. I'm saying why don't make all, it. All I'm saying is, this, let me just, let me just can I finish. Go ahead. Can I finish? Okay. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say, but go ahead. All right. All right. That's fine. Two turnovers, holding Patrick Mahomes to 19 points in regulation. Would without Dre Greenlaw for the majority of the game, would you say the defense did their job? In the Super Bowl, yes, I would. All right. I'm not I'm, my point is he's not getting dumped because of the Super Bowl. And if people think he is, they're wrong. He's getting dumped because um you, you he's getting dumped because the, the front didn't match the back end. And 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 also because last year they were number one in defense, and this year they're number 12 in defense. Um, last year they were fourth in offense. This year they're first in offense. Last year they were number one in defense. This year they're number 12 in defense. This year they didn't stop the run. Now, I don't blame Wilkes for not stopping the run. I really don't. Uh, we, you and I, You didn't I, have the guys here to stop the run. Like you We're and forgetting I, about the fact that we went and got – we had to go get Chase Young. We had to go get Randy Gregory. We had to go get Sebastian Joseph Day. We're forgetting the fact that Eric Armstead was out for a considerable amount of time. We're forgetting about the, about the, about the fact where regularly, week to week, we were wondering if Javon Hargrave was even worth being on the field in the first two downs of the game. Like, that's facts. Like, well, I a mean, lot of this was on these players, man. A lot of it was on these guys. Their run D was bad. But they, yeah, it was they were, it was personnel related. I thought, um, I I wouldn't put that on Steve, but it was clear that Shanahan didn't have a trust in him, and um, I know Shanahan made a deal a big deal about well he came from outside. I don't think that matters. I really don't. I mean, Steve had credentials. He's done it before. He's been a head coach. He's been a coordinator. It's just he, it's just funny to me how we like. Where the ire decides to to focus itself. That's all. I mean, I under like, and for me, even if for me personally, if the players don't want Coach Wilkes, then he's got to go. Full stop. For me, so I'm not mad that he's gone. All right. If the players don't want him, then there's no point of having him in the building. All right. So I'm not mad at that. My issue is, is that the way he got fired, it it made it seem like from the outside looking in that he is the reason why we lost. And he, he it looked like it looked like the sacrificial lamb for a loss that we should have won. Everybody believes that we should have won that game. It feels like that was the penance paid that Wilkes had to go. And for me, I think that's disingenuous because from a coaching staff, there's plenty of blame to go around, especially on the offensive side of the ball. They got out coached. That offensive line got outplayed and out coached. Kyle Shanahan got out coached. Debo Samuel got shut down and outplayed. Those are facts. And those are the things that nobody wants to talk about because we've been waiting to get rid of Wilkes for his blunders throughout the year, which can be true. That can be a discussion. But I just think that it's very coincidental that that seems to be the top of discussion when our genius head coach pretty much laid down one of the worst coaching performances in NFL in, in the NFL Super Bowl. And he's blown his second Super Bowl. So but I just don't feel surprised. like it's kind of funny that we're talking about Coach Wilson. And then honestly, it's almost does the narrative good because then it is the scapegoat debate, but I don't care about it being a scapegoat. He's gone. Get him out of here. What conversation are we willing to have for the offense for the offense? Honestly, I mean, don't be surprised who scored 19 points regulation. So if we wanted to, I'll give you, I'll concede to Wilk should be gone. The team didn't believe in him. Our biggest players that are leaders on this team didn't believe in him. He's got to go. 
cool. He's out of here. Now, what are you going to say about our offense putting up 19 points? What are you going to say about the first three drives of the second half where we where we pass the ball nine out of 10 times and we go away from the run game? What are you going to say about Debo Samuel coming in here saying that he had the worst season and that he was going to step his game up and he flopped? He could not get open. Like, why are we thinking like there's not real conversations to be had on this team? But we want to sit here and talk about Coach Wilkes. And well, he's Wilkes the one. He's enough. the one that got fired. Um, and, and that's my point because yeah. he's the one that got fired. But that's it shouldn't where be a the surprise. Conversation is lying because nobody wants to talk about how Kyle got out coached. He got out. He got embarrassed, and then yeah, he but, lied. He but lied not. about knowing what he had to do on OT, and then it comes out that the players didn't even know what was going on. But nobody wants to have that discussion. I saw somebody with over 70,000 subscribers on YouTube get on and say, Kyle Shanahan doesn't deserve to be held accountable. How can you hold him accountable? You're scared. You're scared. Don't point at me. It ain't right. Yeah, I know you ain't talking about me. Um, I don't know who said that, but as far as none of this should be surprising because Shanahan is never, we talked about this the other day. We talked about this going into the game. I said, if the 49ers fall short, who will be blamed? I knew it. we both knew it wasn't going to be Shanahan. Shanahan was not going to blame himself for losing to and it would have went a long way. If he did, it would have went a long way. Kyle, you're not going anywhere, Kyle. Like that's what's so confusing about him not taking accountability. It ain't like you're going to get fired. It ain't like Jed is going to let you go. What's the problem with just being honest? Like, yeah, man, we caused some things up front that just didn't go our way. We we, we messed up on offense. You know, Debo, we I, I put out a game plan for Debo where we tried to single him out. We should have got Brandon invite. It's like, dude, don't gas like the situation. Like everything is just perfect, man. Like that's disingenuous, man. Well, but, but it's, it's, it's insulting. Su- honestly, it's, it's insulting. It's, it, I I can't get an exercise because it's not surprising. I never expected to see him come out and blame himself. It's not his way. He doesn't do it. Um, you know, I mean, we can, the rest of us can point out the, the obvious blunder in overtime, uh, you know, <clears throat> Kansas city gave up 17 points a game in the regular season. The Niners scored what 22. So they scored a little bit over what they would typically score a game went overtime. So that also have factors in, but I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a great offensive performance. I didn't love the plan. I agree. Shanahan needs to be criticized for the third quarter, three and outs, where they ran nine plays and eight of them were passes, and and you got the you know the, one of the best running backs in pro football sitting right there, and you couldn't get a first down for three straight drives in the third quarter. I mean, to me, that's where that's my biggest. That's where complaint. you lost the game, quite honestly. Those yeah. three squandered drives, like that's that's the part that kind of just blows me away. Like we scored negative, we had negative two yards in in those three drives combined. I know that's malfeasance, man. Well, and the you're fact not going to blow those drives away. You're not going to beat Mahomes in the fourth. Come on, I mean, you know, you're not. I mean, this is where you're the guy, not. You, so you had to beat him in the third. You got to get him in the third. They couldn't do it. Smack Jones says Brock has no power to tell Kyle. Debo is strapped. Debo True. Debo wasn't healthy, I don't think, uh, but his game was terrible. I mean, he dropped balls. He he couldn't get open. He couldn't get separation. You know, this is where Kansas City was better. McDuffie and um, Sneed were better than Debo and Ayuk. Um, that's the that's the part that nobody's to blame for, really. That's yeah. just personnel, right? Um, we got this one from Tyler Wise Guy. He says to all the fanboys in some media that want Kyle fired for losing in the Super Bowl, you're all idiots. Jed loves Kyle. He'll be here for for twenty plus years. Well, first of all. They're not idiots if they want Kyle fired. You're saying that you I mean, they can anybody can want something that's not going to happen. Doesn't mean they're idiots. It just means if you're expecting Kyle to be fired, you're an idiot. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? If you're yeah, thinking, if you're expecting him to be fired, you're an idiot. But if you yeah. want him to be fired, that's a regular human emotion. And if yeah. you think that even even approaching broaching the subject of why Kyle should be fired for what just happened, then you're cucked. You're cucked. I'm sorry. You're a grown man that 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 chills for another well, grown man that does I mean, not know you. 
here's the, here's the bottom line on this thing. It, I, I agree. I'm I made the distinction. I just made the distinction. If you're expecting him to be fired, you're not following this that close. Okay. If you want him to be fired, that's fine. But I I need to have a who you going to next. Yeah. Because the Niners yeah. had a coach that they went to the Super Bowl with, and they fired him. And they fired him before they had his replacement. And look what happened. It took them on a seven-year journey of nothingness. So you want to get rid of Shanahan? That's fine. But you got to tell me who you're going to, and it's got to be somebody damn good. Um, and I guess there are people that could say, hey, go to Belichick, right? I mean, he's out there. So that is an answer. You could fire uh, Kyle Shanahan tomorrow and go to Belichick if you wanted to as the head coach. That'd be ridiculous. They're, you well, know they're what I'm not, saying? Like, and, not and, like, and, and I agree with that. Like, if you're going to say the words like he should be fired, like he needs to be fired, then you got to come with something else behind it. It can't just be he needs to go, but it's a pattern. And like the like you can't have like this staunch defense as if even broaching the subject is like completely out of the realm of possibility. Like, wake up. Coaches get fired. I mean, this is a guy who if he were fired. There would probably be coaches in college and, and pro football that would be fired as well just mm-hmm. because teams would want to get a hold of Kyle Shanahan. Kyle mm-hmm. Shanahan is, is – is, I mean, let's be honest about it. He's widely regarded as one of the best coaches in pro football, and, mm-hmm. and he cannot get beyond the fact that he has not performed well as a coach in big games. So can he not handle the pressure? Can he not handle the, to be seen. The, the scrutiny? You either, you know, you either have. The only thing I'll say is, before you run this guy out, just understand that this was Andy Reid in Philly, and Andy Reid's got three rings now. So, are you willing to cut, to fire Kyle and watch him win three rings potentially somewhere else? Because it could happen. Or you um, trade him. Or or here here's the other question: You trade him? I even think about that. But here, how many years does Kyle Shanahan deserve? He's had seven, I believe, right? I'd give him 10. Um, Reed had 13 in Philly before they said, enough, you're out of here. How many years before he actually is on the hot seat? He's not on the hot seat. Jed loves him. Lynch is, is his hand-picked general manager. Mm-hmm. Um, the team's making money. They're being Jed said he would be happy with losing to the Lions in the NFC Championship game. So if you're, I wish I ha- know he wishes he could take that back. If you're happy like, losing to the Lions in the NFC Championship game, then you got to be happy losing the Super Bowl. So Jed's obviously firmly in over the Kyle's move. camp. How many years is a? F- let's be fair. Not you know if we're trying to be fair minded, how many years do you give Shanahan before you say you know what? You've had a lot of opportunity, and you're not getting it done. Mm-hmm. Some people are already there. Mm-hmm. I'm not there yet. I would say I'm three or four years away. So mm-hmm. give me three or four more years of Shanahan, and then if we get to year 10, 11, we're in that neighborhood, mm-hmm. it's time for me to find somebody else. That's where I'm I at. just think, honestly speaking, I I have one, for me, I believe that there's one threshold and one threshold alone that will put Kyle's career, uh, Kyle's coaching career here um, in jeopardy. And that's if we miss the playoffs because that's about money, right? So let's be clear. Kyle, from a sports, in my opinion, is broken down in three tiers, right? There's the marketing, the entertainment, and the sport. Right. Or the the money, the entertainment in the sport. Okay, so the entertainment is at an all time high because we're sitting here talking about it. Right. And the money is through the roof. So the sport always comes last. Right. So what we're actually talking about, which is the actual sport. This is the part that Kyle and the, the people involved, they could care less. We're the help. Right. We can go back and forth over the downs and the shit played. We can we can go and, you know, quibble over the crumbs that were left on the table after they've eaten, which is they've taken the money. So if Kyle doesn't make it to the playoffs, then I think 
Dr. York would come down, who's the real decision maker and say, listen, all right, for all that's worth, we understand that you, you know, that, you know, you, you know, for the Yorks are concerned, Kyle could just keep blowing Super Bowls as long as he keeps taking them to the playoffs and giving them two home playoff games. Like they don't care. So their biggest thing with Kyle is, hey, man, just keep making the playoffs. Now, if you start missing the playoffs, we can get anybody in here to miss the playoffs. And that, that's not what we're interested in. We're here to make sure that you keep making us money. So if Kyle, if we get to the point where our team is jeopardizing going to the playoffs, I think Kyle will be on the hot seat because it will be past Jed. It would be Dr. York. I mean, it's like, look at, you know, Belichick won Super Bowls. He's out. Pete Carroll won a Super Bowl. He's out. I mean, if you don't make the playoffs. Do you think the Yorks are football people? I don't think the Yorks are the Yorks. The the York isn't like the Yorks aren't like Eddie. They're not like the DeBarto. They're not. They're not. They're they're here to make the same family. It's the same. Yeah, I mean, I know it's the same family, but they're not like Eddie. Well, Eddie was Eddie. Eddie's bottom line coincided with the fans' bottom line. Uh, Eddie wasn't. Eddie didn't care if the team lost ten million dollars. Eddie wanted to win the Super Bowl, and and where I think the Yorks care more about the bottom line uh, than Eddie ever did. Eddie saw the big picture and would take a you know loss in the present financially to win the Super Bowl. He did. Uh, 84, I think they lost like 10, 12 million dollars and they won the Super Bowl and yet, you know, it was it was arguably one of the most successful years in Niners history and yet That's they lost true, Bronson. You know. What's that? Mm-hmm. No, I saw a comment that I agreed with. Oh, okay, what do you say? I, let me get he let me said Eddie get, had to deal with this uh with the salary cap. And he didn't have to deal with the salary yeah, cap. Did, yeah, he did. Yeah, and he yeah. didn't have to deal with the salary cap. I will say this. The Niners organization gave every player a $1,700 Peloton. And I, when I was reading about that, I was reading about how the NFL has limits for what teams can spend on gifts for their players. And they wanted to maximize that money. So they did give every player a full-on, you know, Peloton and this and that. So they're trying to take care of their players, but the league is kind of almost, um, you know, put in rules to counter that. 49er George, 365 with the C-note. My goodness, give a little clap there. Thanks, buddy. He says, hashtag not lazy, Larry. I've listened to you for 20 years, it seems. However, your opinions this year were trusted above all else. Thanks, Krug. Thank you. Pity for your thoughts, man. Man, thank you. Thank you. That was very cool. NorCal Danny Muzzy says, I played college baseball and, and love boxing. Go back to the fastball and a, to- and, and a topic to the jab. A topic to the jab. Third round and four. A third and four. Go back to the run with CMC. There Banks you go. And Trent. Reed trusts his players. Kyle if, trusts his if, players. If you're thinking, if you if you're thinking, if you're thinking scheme on that third and four for us to win the game with to win the game on points with time running out, because that's what that third that third and four was for the game, right there. Why on God's green earth would you load up all of your assets in one play? That's too down territory, right there, dog. I'm giving that ball to Christian McCaffrey two times in a row, and we're running the ball two times. We what, are what? What did uh, when Kansas City got the ball back after that? How much time did they have? Do you remember? Mm, hold on, I have it in front of me. Because I'm that would have been it would have been nice to burn some of that clock. Yeah, you know? yeah. Nice. Hold on. So I'm going back in game. Yeah, they get the ball when they tie it up 1919. They get the ball with 153 left. Yeah. That would have been nice if that was closer to, you know, one one minute or 50 one minute. seconds. Yeah. Would have been, they different. Get the ball would have been back. a different different deal. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I, just, I, I you know You know what I'm saying? I, 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 just, I was okay it's like with that right there. It's like first, run the ball. That's two down territory. You don't put all of that in one play. Well, but here's the thing on that one though. They got two receivers that both both were open on that play if they just block it correctly. I mean, if they block that thing correctly, Jennings had if Brock had even a half second more, the throw to Jennings, Jennings was wide open, and Ayuk was even more wide open because Sneed slipped. Now you're down. talking about the last play in overtime. Are you talking about the overtime play? Is that what we're talking about? That's what play? you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. That's okay. what I'm talking about. 
I was talking about the third and four on the last drive to uh, to go up to 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 keep the ball to keep our to keep the ball. It was the uh, the blitz by McDuffie, right? Which was, uh, you know, let's credit uh, Spags. He, it was a great call on his part. You know, he didn't sit back. He rolled the dice and he got yeah. home with his he got home with his best rusher. I mean, one of the things that bothered me the most about this game was how often it seemed like the 49ers went at McDuffie, considering he was an all pro player. I mean, they went to Debo on McDuffie a lot. Well, a Debo, lot. well, that's Kyle. It, I don't think that it was thick. Yo, listen, this is a scheme. This isn't a traditional team where where Brock has the full autonomy to switch his reads, to call things contemporaneously on the field. These boys are going in with a set play. And if they don't like that, there's contingencies off of it inside of the play. Outside of that, he gets to improvise. He doesn't get to make a whole sweeping change that he sees on the field. We saw what Ray Ray did when Ray Ray saw that there was a corner that fell and he went off on his own. Brock went ballistic on him. Like you need to be where I need you to be. So yeah. this is all about Kyle. All right. And if you want to say that Trip McDuffie got a lot of reps, that's because Kyle made Debo the number one read on a lot of those plays. Brock is only doing what he's asked to do. All right. And that's what I'm saying. Like, Kyle didn't make that adjustment. Kyle, how many targets did it take Kyle before he realized, all right, you know what, Debo, you need to come off the X. Brandon, you're the X. Or, or did he just keep calling it? That's the contemporaneous stuff we're talking about in the flow of the game, realizing that I know we planned for this, but Debo, we've targeted you seven times, eight times, nine times. It ain't working. We got to get you out of that. We got to put Brandon in there. He just didn't switch it. Not that, you know, it's like you can play music. You can, there's a difference between playing, being able to play a song on the piano. And then there's a whole different ball game of knowing how to read sheet music. You can put anything in front of me and I can play it. So that, that's what we saw. Kyle just, he struggles with making adjustments, things that we're seeing on the field. He will not change it. I wanted to see Ayuk get the ball more in this game than he did. We'll get to Ayuk in just a second. Too much sauce said, should Cam Latou start over Kittle next season? Cam um, barely made the team. Should Cam Latou start over Kittle next season? No. <laughs> uh, let me think about it. No. Uh, Mark Failer says, Larry, you and Guru didn't see my super chat yesterday, but I wanted to get your thoughts on Jimmy as a potential quarterback too next season. No way. No way. I'd rather have I'd rather have first of all Jimmy has too many good relationships in that room that would be totally unfair to just bring him into that situation as the backup. There's just no way. There's just no way. I would say Darnold's going to move on, Brandon Allen's going to be there and that third quarterback is likely to be either a young veteran like a Davis Mills or somebody who crapped out somewhere else or a rookie. And I think they'll save money on the quarterback. Now that they know Brock is is their firm number one, they'll be happy to let Darnold walk and have Brandon Allen be the number two. And I think that number three guy is going to be a kid. It's going to be either somebody with upside who's young. Uh, I mentioned Davis Mills and Zach Wilson. Um, or it's going to be somebody from the draft. I, I don't think it's going to be like a veteran, um, especially an accomplished veteran. I really don't. Um, and I'm not sure if Jimmy's a great backup quarterback, to be to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. Kent says, I think using analytics to make the decision to take the ball in overtime showed weakness in Kyle. Trust your guys and yourself, and Mahomes is too good. Yeah, I mean, you know what? You're, I think his analytics people let him down, to be honest. I really do. I mean, if he lists, if that answer and, and his decision to take the ball was the, was was, you know, our analytics people talked it over, I think your analytics people need to talk it over again. Um, that would be my, I you know, and I'm not saying that they don't have good analytics people, but that, that was not a good decision. I'd much rather have Mahomes go first and then know what I need to, to do than have Mahomes go second. And, you know, I get the feeling that maybe Mahomes won the game on what they were going to use as their, as their two-point conversion play. Um 
you know that was that was the other thing. And by the way, um, on the on the play that you were just talking about, Coach, where McDuffie was used on the blitz, mm-hmm. you know, Spagnola in the uh, Spagnolo in the interview with Baldy said that he had had like a fourth down play, yeah, as like you know how he wanted to counter a key fourth down, and he just went with that right there, even though it was third down. Um, and that's just, you know, there's a coach who, you know, yeah, in the game planning said, okay, this is what I'm going to go to to try to blow up a, a key a key fourth down. But he was willing to use it in third down because he felt like it was the game. Um, so, you know, credit Spagnolo for, Spagnolo for being, you know, for understand, being resourceful and, and being flexible. Uh, he had a, a plan that he wanted to use, a play that he wanted to use. He used it. Uh, Tyler Wise Guy says the Niners should trade up in the draft and pick Tally Isi Fuaga, offensive tackle, Oregon State. Make O line a strength, build up the D line and the O line. All right, that leads us into Brandon Ayuk. Coach, what are you going to do if I make you John Lynch right now? What are you doing with Ayuk? And when I say that, what I mean is it's easy to say, pay him. Oh, you know what? Pay him. Pay him. He wants twenty six million. Pay him, but you're already paying Debo twenty eight million dollars. You're also twenty eighth or thirty second or whatever it is in the NFL in pass attempts. So no team passes less than you, and you're going to have fifty million dollars tied up in your wide receivers. I'm not sure that that makes sense. Then take Tyler's comment here. He's saying Taliesi Fuaga, but in some ways, I think the guy who the Niners need the most is J.C. Latham, who's from your Bama Crimson Tide. He's the right tackle, big number 65. I love J.C. He's 335 pounds. He's a plug-and-play right tackle. He's the kind of piece that they really don't have. I love Fuaga, too. He's tough, and he'll fight you, and I love both those guys, and they're both going to go in the middle of the first round. But there was some speculation that that Ayuk maybe, and I don't know if his brother or if it's his sister, but somebody was like, you know, this is how you treat Brandon. He gets three targets in the Super Bowl. This is why we're leaving. Um, he was asked about if he's coming back. He's like, if the if the conditions are right, he was asked about that. He said, well, if we're going to win a championship, I'm coming back. So if you're Lynch – do you sign this guy and have two wide receivers making $50 million and let Jawan walk? Or do you re-sign Jawan, trade Ayuk for maybe a 13th pick in the first round deal with the Raiders, and then turn Ayuk into J.C. Latham? How would you play your hand there? I mean, in a perfect world, um, we sign uh, B.A. and... Uh you know, I, I I really have no, I don't have any cut cards on getting rid of Debo. I just don't think nobody would take his money. Um, he's due to make a lot of money. Debo has to take a pay cut. He has to. He's not worth twenty seven million dollars annually. That's just not a thing. Um, so really, that's the band aid side of it, right? The band aid that you should rip off if you're going to do the right thing is take the money that Debo's using and put it on Brandon because Debo did not play up to his contract and he didn't play up to the the money that he's about to get next year. There's no way he, he deserves that. Um, he's not worth it. Um, but, um, I do agree with you. $50 million in two receivers is a lot of money, man. Uh, and we have to figure out where else to go with that outside of trading somebody else to keep BA, which is what I want to do. Um, you might trade BA. Um, now I put this out on Twitter and I kind of want to retool it now because I've, I listened to some, uh, some guys on Twitter and they actually made some really good points, but I was actually putting out, you know, there's an, there's an opportunity for us to trade BA. I mean, really what we try to get, what we try to get on, uh, what we try to get from BA is they BA is used to clear out a lot of stuff. Um, used to clear out routes. But one thing that B.A. does not do is he's not necessarily used as like a huge speed threat. And that's something that I know you were talking about for the Niners is that we don't necessarily have anybody that's a real speed threat that can actually scare a defense to take the top off, to take the top off the defense. And also uh, getting uh, Brock being able to get them the ball. 
I would trade B.A. to Detroit for Jamison Williams for Jamison Williams in the second round pick. I take the Jamison Williams, the second round pick, and I would take that second round pick and throw it to Philly for Hassan Reddick. And then I go get myself a tackle in the first round. Mm. At, at the end of the first round. At the end of the first round, yeah. Yeah. So not not Latham, not uh, Fuaga, because those guys mm-hmm. are probably Because you're going to have to trade. For, in the Latham world, the Fuaga world, we got to trade up. We got to give assets away to get up there. And we're, yeah. you know, we're as low as you can get. We're at 31. Yeah. No, I know. I know. So, um, I, I'm not even 100% sure that people are like, well, they have to go offensive tackle in round one. Well, no, they don't. I mean, if um, there's, you know, I like Javon. It's a very rich tackle draft. Yeah. I mean, I, I like Christian Young uh, uh, from uh, Texas. I like uh, I like uh, Ladarius Henderson from Michigan. Um, I really like um, um, uh, the guy from Missouri. I think his name's Javon Walker, maybe. Uh, the, uh, the the offensive tackle in number seventy six, none of those guys are supposed to go in the, in the first round. I mean, the Niners. I if you said to me, a gun to your head, what are they going to do in the first round? I would say they're going to go defensive line. You know, they always go defensive line, um, and they yeah. need a lot of defensive linemen. They gets they only have six under contract that are any good. Uh, they got six that are free agents. So you know that's well, Fuaga. You can't do Fuaga. Fuaga's ranked third. Like in scouting, like he's the third ranked tackle in the draft, bro. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, that's going to be a little hard. JC Latham is kind of out of it. He's fourth ranked. This is my guy, Amarius Mims. Amarius Mims may be around. Now, you know, I've been talking to you about Amarius Mims all year. Um, yeah. So 6'7", 340, 5, 340, big standout prospect. Uh, he's a rare blend of size, athleticism, and strength. Um, I'm a big Amarius Mims fan. So, I mean, he's somebody that we can get over there. But honestly speaking, but he, he, they're, they're re- saying he may go in the 20s, early 20s. Okay. Well, he's 6'7", Ameri- 330. I mean, what an athlete. Right. Well, you know, another super guy, athletic. I'll raise you. If you don't like Amarius Mims, Tyler well, Guyton out of Oklahoma. Uh, yeah. In fact, I talked to Trent Williams about Guyton. He likes him. You know, yeah. he, he's, you know, they both went to Oklahoma. Uh, what I like about Guyton is he's kind of a destroyer in the run game. Mm-hmm. Um, and he'll probably be there. You know, he'll probably be there because he's Patrick he's thought, Paul out of Houston is is a good guy too. Yeah, I know Brad really likes him. He's from he's a six seven guy with long mm-hmm. arms and see. But this know, is the thing, though. I think that they're going to keep Colton. Colton struggled this year at times, but he did show some good consistency for long stretches of time throughout the season, and he's already seen the best of the best as far as. The pass rushers in the league is supposed are are supposed, and this was his only. This was his first true year starting, right? So you're going to look for a little bit more of comfortability from him at that position. I think that they're going to keep Colton at the right tackle position. I think oh, as the starter, as the I, starter, see, I, I don't I think they I, will. I think I think they're going to move him. I think they they're going to try. That he's going to be their swing tackle, jack of all trades guy. I think. I think they really badly want to get a premier right tackle. So, uh, you know, uh, whether it's first round or second round or in a trade, um, you know, I, 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 I don't think they're going to come back. I think they realize that they need to upgrade their offensive line. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, that's just I – Well, mean, they I'm don't just, value it. I'm that's guessing the problem. At that point. They don't well, they value haven't. it. Yeah. They haven't. I mean, well, you know what? It's, it's, here's the thing. Do they not value it or do they just value the D-line – over the O line, and they've made enough mistakes on the D line where they have to keep drafting there. Because so- if they if they had hit on Solomon Thomas, do they take Kinlaw? If they had hit on Kinlaw, do they? I mean, do they they keep going D line because I feel like they're not they're missing in the draft, so they're drafting. All right, well, that position. All right, well, if they keep going D line, if they keep going D line because they're missing in the draft, then why did why didn't they keep going offense offensive line? They missed on Mike McGlinchey. They didn't keep going to get tackles. Like they no. missed on him. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I, why did they not go with Daywan Jones? I mean, you you went with Cam Latou and and Moody, the kicker over Daywan Jones. Did you Jones? see the job that Daywan Jones had against Nick Bosa? He had a great game against Nick uh, Bosa. It was a freaking house! I mean, Daywan Jones is is six seven three seventy or something like that. Motherfucker's a house, bro. He he could have been. 
Uh, he's an apartment building. I mean, that guy's just ridiculous. Mike Nolan says, Krug and Coach, do you side more with Grant Cohn or David Lombardi on recent Kittle criticism regarding mic'd up, hey, George, fumble, et cetera? I'm not sure what either said. I would well, guess. They're both, they're, you know that they're both on both extremes. So, you know, Grant. Uh, so what? What's know, Grant saying? Grant is saying that it's inexcusable, that it was it an is embarrassing. It is, yeah, and it's it par is. for the course. Yeah, and and David is, you know, he's on the far side of it, saying that it's like David literally said, "If you have a problem with this play, you do not know football. Like if you if you have any issue with this play, then you're outing yourself on your knowledge of football." That's what he said. Well, I mean, I and I understand what he's saying. He's saying that that wasn't Kittle's play to make. That it's just, it's just, it just happened. It just happened. Um, all I would say is what you said, and what I would say if I were coaching high school football. Take Kittle's name out of it, because when you throw Kittle, it's like, oh, he's a star. You're mm -hmm. ripping a star. Take Kittle out of it. Pretend mm -hmm. we're talking high school football. Damn right, there's a coaching point there. You you mm -hmm. go to the whistle. Yeah, you go to the whistle. Thing. It's like that's David that, and Grant. It's like if that was your son, and you're watching your son play a high school football game, or you're watching your son play a sporting event, and you see that with your son, are you going to look at your son and tell him that's not a big deal? No, Keep I would say you. I would say talk less and let's focus until we hear the whistle going forward. Mm -hmm. And 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 yet I understand what Dave's saying from the standpoint of. You can't say, oh, my God, Kittle. It wasn't – Kittle did not fumble that ball. And right. Kittle Kittle was a considerable way away from uh, McCaffrey when that ball hit the carpet. But mm -hmm. you keep playing until the whistle. And if George were here, I would say that to George. And if George is the kind of guy that I think he is, and I know he is, he would agree with me. He would mm -hmm. say, Krug, you're right. Um, I talk on the field because that's how I play. Um, I, I, under cut. I understand that I got to play to the whistle. That's it. That is it. So forget the, you know, I, I if Grant's burying him like, hey, you know what? He's the reason the 49ers lost the Super Bowl. No, I'm not, and that's I'm, the, not, and that's, I'm not going the there. Thing. But if Dave's covering him like you can't be critical, I'm not going yeah, there. He, like, like Grant. Grant is saying what we're saying, but we're just finalizing it. Grant is saying it was a Bush League move. It's par for the course. It's unprofessional. You can't do that, right? And on top of it, Grant's saying what everybody else is saying is that it kind of is defining you. Like, it's a it, that's the way it works. Like, it's a big moment in time, and people are going to remember that. You know what I'm saying? So that's what Grant is saying. David is saying that taking, taking umbrage with it at all is outing your knowledge of the game of football period. It's not a big deal whatsoever. Um, so uh, I, I fall somewhere in the middle um, because I don't think, I don't think that that's not a big deal at all. I think that's a big deal. I think it's a huge deal, honestly, because um, well, you got to play to the whistle. Focus. It speaks to focus. I mean, it's real simple. I mean, you play to the whistle. There's yeah. no ambiguity about that. You play to the whistle. Yeah. Did he play to the whistle? No. He was talking on the back end. While mm -hmm. he was talking, the guy that he was talking to, to. Was, was playing to the whistle. That's the so, issue. You know what I mean? A, it was a mistake by Kittle, clearly. If he were sitting here, he would own it. Um, but I'm not going to sit there and say that you know Kittle is the reason they lost the game. No. And it, no. And it wasn't like, man, if Kittle had recovered that fumble... That would have been a spectacular play by Kittle of heads up awareness. The fact that Karloftis uh, recovered the fumble is just shows that Karloftis, you know, needs to be credited. I don't know that I would blame George other than he likes to have a dialogue, and that's fine, but after the whistle. Yeah. After the whistle, not before. Yeah. Clean it so up. I, if I got to side with one or the other on that, I'm probably siding with Grant. Um, I, 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 but I, but I'm in the camp of really. It's, it's, it was a mistake by George, but it also was bad luck. 
Uh, General Admission says Belichick wants to keep his legacy intact. It makes sense for him to go to San Francisco for a year to slow down the KC dynasty. Um, I think it makes sense to go to San Francisco for a year because Bill Belichick has coached in the NFL every single season since 1975. And is he really going to yuck it up on TV with a bunch of people that don't know football the way he does? I don't see that. I don't see that. I, he's, I, I not that. All right. he's not coaching. Hey, you know what? I want to give you your flowers, man. You were the first person to put out the Belichick as a DC narrative. Oh, and and I got time, ripped. Ripped. At the time, you got lambasted. Yeah. I'm talking about they raked you over the coals. And I just find it funny that nobody is coming back to apologize or well, to say to you, Larry, happen. you were the first person to bring up Bill Belichick. I brought it up and thought it was a bad take. Everybody brought it up. And nobody's going to sit here and tell you to your face, you were right. You were right. Simply because you had the balls to raise the issue and get dunked on by that. Yo, that tweet got hundreds of thousands of views. There are hundreds of thousands of people that went on top of you, that stood on top of your head and dunked on you. And now that everybody is, that's just the skeevy nasty world of Twitter and the sports world. Like nobody wants to say, well, a month ago, Larry did bring this up and we all kind of <laughs> laughed at him. <laughs> like, so I want to give you your, I want to give you your flowers, man, because I said this, I, that happened to me about chase. I said, I hated the chase trade and who the fuck, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Right, and right, who right. are you? And it's like, here we are. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, you get your flowers, Larry. You well, it's funny talking about Bill Belichick. My 14 year old came up to me. He's like, dad, you've had some bad takes, but this is the worst take of all. And I'm like, <laughs> you and your son? <laughs> and, yeah, my 14 year old. He's like, dad, this is the worst take of all. And I said, you know what? I'm just saying it, it's, it's not, it's not crazy because I think Belichick really wants to coach. And I think Shanahan and the Niners, if they lose are going to need, I mean, think about it. It, if the Niners are going to get people excited, you can't fire Steve Wilkes and replace him with Daniel Sorensen. I mean, there's going to be some guys in the room that are going to be like, really? But if you replaced him with Bill Belichick, everybody's on board. Everybody's yeah. on board. Now, I don't know that Belichick, it would take a huge ego. Um, he'd have to seriously minimize his ego, and so would Kyle, right? Because Kyle... Mm-hmm. Kyle would look, uh, you know, there'll be people saying Kyle couldn't get it done without Belichick if he gets it done with him. Uh, Belichick's going to be, you know, have people going, dude, you're a defensive coordinator now. Um, you know, but I think he's all about ball. I think you don't, you can pay him whatever you want. I'd pay him $10 million a year, 12. Kyle's making right, 14. So let me ask you this. This is one thing that I don't think people realize. Pay him whatever he wants. Coach, Coach Belichick and Kyle actually have a very good relationship. Right. They really like each other. Um, And one of the reasons why Coach Belichick even felt okay with Jimmy leaving is the fact that he was going to the 49ers, that he was at least going to be with Kyle. So there's a really big, there's a lot of respect between them. So you know what? Could it be that Coach Belichick, Uncle Bill, needs to come in and kind of, kind of put Kyle on his knee and say, hey, listen, kid, this is where you're kind of failing in some of your areas of game processing. There's nobody, there's not a better game manager than Bill Belichick. You know what I'm saying? If there's anybody who knows how to understand and dot all the I's and cross all the T's and understand situational football, literally what's happening in the moment, Bill Belichick would be huge for Kyle if he could get him in the building because then that would be somebody that Kyle can't push around. And it would also be somebody and and wouldn't try and wouldn't try. Right. And it would be somebody who also when he talked, it would not have to be a lot and everybody would listen. And you need that in a room with Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch and uh, and Bobby Turner and Chris Kasarik. You need a stronger voice, a guy that's been there. I feel like in a way, maybe this coaching staff could could gain from getting like a, an experienced guy like Coach Belichick in there to kind of look at their organization and say, hey, guys, 
here are some of the things that I've been doing over the past couple of years that I had on my run. And, you know, you guys are kind of missing the boat right here in your practice scripts or, hey, these are some of the situational things that you guys need to kind of be ready for on a week to week basis in games, you know, or helping Kyle out with low, knowing how to pace guys out with injuries, how to be an OK with sitting down Dre Greenlaw. I mean, that's something that I feel like is one of the nastiest things that we are not talking about is the fact that Dre Greenlaw's Achilles injury was a fluke injury. That was not a fluke injury. That was a calculated risk by the team to keep playing him. Dre Greenlaw had been hurt with that Achilles for a months, for months, and they were managing that thing. He should have sat out in the playoffs, right? These are things that you need an older coach that actually has a lot of vigor left and vitality, right, as a coach that can sit Kyle down and make him listen to him. Because quite frankly, being away from, I'll say this before you go, being away from football really hurts you as far as your perspective, your eye, and what you can expect. Kyle can't only keep going to his dad. He's got to get somebody who literally is still coaching now. I think that would help him. Harbaugh had Brad Seeley, right? Harbaugh was maniacal on the sidelines, but he had Brad Seeley. Brad Seeley was a calm veteran coach who was there and helped him uh, manage games. Kyle really needs two things here. He needs a defensive coordinator, and he needs an in-game respected voice to help him make decisions in-game about a number of different things. I think Belichick could be both. I really a do. Two for one. I, I think he could be a two-for-one. He could be the guy that's on the headsets that helps you make smart decisions about game management, and he could be your defensive coordinator. And and I and Kyle makes fourteen million dollars. Belichick made twenty five. I would say to Belichick, hey, here's twenty five million dollars, two year deal, twelve five a year. Come in, be the defensive coordinator. Let's win a ring. It, it, the only reason I think it could work is that both Kyle and Belichick would have to minimize their egos, and uh, to make this work. And so I think if if it was just about Kyle's ego, it would be one thing. If it was just about Belichick's ego, it would be one thing. But in reality, they both have to show some vulnerability to one another and both have to, um, you know, kind of subvert their egos to make this a working thing. I, I think it's I think it's far and away the best, uh, best decision they could possibly make. But Mr. Bay Area says bring in Mike Holmgren for OC or head coach. Mike Holmgren is in his mid 70s i heard him on the he's radio done, done. yeah he's retired blood moon says look these guys got the bag to put the uh, fucking effort but they need to be led by the dc chemistry matters vrabel is a former player to relate um, i don't think i don't think vrabel and kyle now that's two personalities that i think would clash right well I then think. they and also i mean let's be honest i mean <clears throat> you bring in belichick even though he's got this incredible resume He's probably not going to take your job. He's not you going to challenge you. You Mike bring in Vrabel. Vrabel. He's going to challenge you for your gig. Yeah, he, he is. Might. He might. He, he is. He, and I mean, they're not even. I mean, dude, Mike Vrabel. <laughs> there's. I'm hearing that there's people scared to interview Mike Vrabel. Oh, that's just the dumbest thing. You ever because, heard that? Never. Never. All right. I've heard I've heard reports that Mike Vrabel, it's a lot. There's there's not a lot of traction on Mike Vrabel getting hired because people are intimidated by him. It's football. Almost I'm just every, telling you that they, they weren't intimidated by Ray Rhodes. They weren't intimidated by Floyd I'm not, Peters. I, look, I just don't. No, I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm just here to I heard you, the I gotta si find I heard, it because I'm not pulling it out of my ass. Like, no, I, I know. Literally no, saw I know. That. No, it's out there. It is out mm -hmm. there. That yeah. there are people that don't want uh, Vrabel because they feel like he's physically intimidating. That is a joke. I mean, that's yeah. ridiculous. Um, and if that's indeed, the, I can't. There's no. There's no real validity. I don't think to to that. Or if it's coming from somebody, uh, that's sad. I mean, it, it's a it's a negative reflection on whoever that's coming from. Green Glass Full says wide receiver one, wide receiver two next season. Chances of a Debo trade. I, I would say there's a very good chance the 49ers trade a wide receiver. Why? Because I think they'll trade Debo. They I need don't, to. 
I don't. I, I think they're going to trade Ayuk because I don't think Debo is going to fetch anything. Yeah, he I did mean, not D- look good. What do you think Debo would get? A third round pick, maybe. A third, maybe. Do you get like a low? You if, if, if for fifth. Debo, you might get like a low second for Debo if he went to like a familiar team that knew how to use him, like that was on the come up, like Debo to the Commanders, right? They got a lot of money to spend, right? Yeah. Or yeah. Um, like that that type of trade. Like, you know, they got Adam Peters over there. You know, they're trying to be us, essentially. Um, that would be enough. That would be a real big splash for them. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But I'm kind of just over it. I'm, I'm I'm over the whole Debo thing. Like, it's time to move on. You yeah, know what I'm saying? I mean, like, he was, he was in the Super Bowl, cousin. It's time. He was very disappointing. I yeah. would say I would say there's a very good chance that there's a wide receiver from the Niners traded. Why? Well, I think JJ's coming back as a restricted, especially the way he played in the playoffs. The way he played in the Super Bowl and in the playoffs, he's not going anywhere. They're, They're not going to commit fifty million dollars to wide receivers. They're just not. I really like Jerry's kid in the draft, and I like uh, McCaffrey's brother. And both those guys could be day two or day three picks uh, mm-hmm. at wide receiver. Um, so you know, I mean, I think I think Brandon out Al- Brandon uh, Rice is tremendous, and I that's a guy that I would definitely go after. I mean, he's Ooh, not. Uh, D- I mean, uh, J- uh, Jerry's son. Yeah, Jerry's son. He can't Jerry's- get any separation, man. I watch film. Uh, he's six four with great hands. Uh, I I'm interested to see as well what his forty time is. But I, I if you ask me, what is he going to run? I bet you anything he's going to run. Four four nine four five two something like that. It's not going to be great, but he's six four. So I mean, you're talking about a bigger receiver anyway. Um, I, I that's why he's not going around one, and he's not going around two, and he may not go in round three. He's maybe more of a round th- uh, four or five guy. But um, but I love him. I love how my only thing I is that running. I just I feel like there's more equity in BA than there is Debo. Oh, definitely. Like, BA is the guy who knows the whole route tree. He can run the whole route tree and get open. He's a plus route runner. He's got a crazy release package. He can get off of press man and off man coverage. And he's a much better blocker than Debo. Like n- night and day. I, and, and for how much it took for us to get him on the same page. Like remember that whole Brandon Ayuk doghouse saga? Like we had to fight through all of that. Now he's a leader. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's, it's no mistake that Diamondo Lenore is coming along. That's BA's mentor, mentee. Like he, he's under his wing. I just, I don't see it. I don't see how Debo is more of an asset than BA, basically on what we had to, and then on a, and then on top of it, BA is barely hurt. Like BA, B, Debo is constantly hurt. All right. We have to motivate him to get in shape. All right. Half of the offense has to be stagnated just for him to get the ball. And then when he doesn't have the ball, he's a liability. And then he's going to be paid $27 million. I don't see it. Uh, I mean, and also, come on. I mean, he's, he's a run through you wide receiver that those guys don't last. They don't last, but I don't think they can get a lot for Debo. Um, I think Debo is probably worth like a fifth round pick. Where Ayuk, you could probably get a number one. So then, then yeah. the question is, you know, what do you want? Um, and 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 do you like some receiver in this draft? Because if you Yo, get rid on, of Ayuk, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing I, like I'm seeing some people just don't know how math works. If we trade Debo, that doesn't mean we don't put anything behind him. We put another requisite weapon behind him. Like, like it's not as if Debo leaves and then all of a sudden B.A. gets doubled. It doesn't work that way. OK, you don't just get rid of an asset and then go to town with what you got. You pay B.A. and then you go get more pieces. That's what I'm saying. Like Debo's. It's not the fact that Debo's skill set isn't needed. It's the fact that it doesn't cost that much. It shouldn't cost that much. You can go find that for the cheap. And it's not as rare as it used to be. Rache Rice, like Zay Flowers, like for guys who are not as physical as Debo, I would take – there's there's guys with Debo's archetype in the league now. It's not rare. We saw it We saw it in Rache Rice. We saw it in Amara St. Brown. Like you can get those guys. You can sign – I mean, one of the free agent uh, wide receivers – I was looking at the free agent list, and one of the free agent wide receivers is LaVisca Chenault. 
I mean, LaVisca Chenault, in a lot of ways, is a poor man's Debo Samuel. Yeah, he um, is. He's, you know, he can play running back. He can play wide receiver. He's, he can do it all. Here are the free agent wide receivers that I think are interesting. Mike Evans, Calvin Ridley, who I really love. I, think I Calvin like Calvin Ridley. Ridley. Calvin Ridley might be an upgrade. Um, Hollywood Brown, T. Higgins, Michael Pittman from Indy, LaVisca Chenault, Chase Claypool. Those are the those are the to me the interesting wide receivers. I mean, I, there's other guys that are free agents as well. Well, but T Higgins are, and those guys are out of the question. T Higgins is really a number one, honestly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, T Higgins you know, is T Higgins is only a number two because he plays with the best receiver in the league. But really, on any other team, T Higgins is a number one receiver, in my opinion. At least I think that. Way. James W F says fire Brian Schneider as well, the special team coordinator. He says special teams coverage and return have been bad. Um, he just got there was a fumble got, on the punt return and it was a missed extra point. Yeah, we've been talking about got special here. teams all year. I don't. I if something tells me he's going to stick. Jimmy Quant's his admission to making mistakes as part of the maturation process. So wait a minute. So why does he get to stay? Well, I'm just saying he he was just brought in. He's had a very good career as a special teams coach. Uh, my guess is that if you said to me, make a wager, will he leave or stay? I think he stays. Okay. I'm just I mean, saying. you know the way you know the way this works. Sometimes the I players knew, knew, that's why, sometimes that's the players why get blamed. We sometimes really the coaches look, no, get blamed. Larry, Larry, you know how it really works. That's why we can't really say. Like it, it was easy to let go of Wilkes. Like it was easy. You know what I'm saying? But he wasn't he wasn't fireable bad. I mean he wasn't fireable bad. I he, was, predicted he had some it. issues. We're not gonna sit here and act like he was perfect. He was not. But I predicted Wilkes would be dumped because I knew Kyle wouldn't fire himself and I knew he would blame the defense. And he did. And Wilkes I, I is out. You know what? You got you you won't hear me talk to you about Wilkes again. You 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 just put it, you just said it. I'm done. I mean, Wilkes was going to be fired. And if you want to call it a scapegoat, you can. He did enough to, there were enough people that weren't happy that, um, and also, I, you know, some of this is Wilkes. I mean, Wilkes has, has worked in a lot of different spots. He moves around a lot. That's his, that's true. That's his football card. Jimmy Quant says admission to making mistakes as part of the maturation process. Until then, no Lombardi for Kyle. Yeah, well, I I agree with Jimmy. I think Kyle should have done what you said, Coach, and just said, "Hey, look, uh, it's on me." But um, he's not there yet. He's just. And not you know there what's yet. crazy is that those moments are like they're they're waiting. You know what I mean? It's like everybody's just kind of waiting for you to just do. It only takes ten minutes. Like. He owned the the tra- he owned the Trey Lance thing, and look how that diffused. I mean, he could have been dragged on the Trey Lance thing, but he owned it so completely and thoroughly that it negated a lot of the criticism. I mean, I think I think the only one with this one is that this one is kind of hitting them from different directions because I feel like there's some players that feel like we feel. Before, I feel like it was always one direction and you can put up a shield when you know where, the, where your cover where your fire is coming from when you're taking on suppressive fire but i feel like kyle is a little skittish because he's never seen it come out of the locker room before those guys were like disappointed like george kittle was disappointed brandon Ayuk was disappointed um and you gotta feel like you walked away from that game like man you're like what were you calling you know what i'm saying especially if i'm brandon Ayuk. No question. I mean, I you know, and you wonder uh, how if Kyle has lost face with some of those players, uh, you know, or do they still have total belief in him? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Kevin Crittenden says Kyle's unwillingness to take accountability for his performance comes with the perfectionist package that he is. You don't get one without the other. Yeah, I think there's probably some truth in that. 49er Faithful says Larry need to tell the owner to fire Kyle. Oh yeah, I'm I'm tight with Chad. I'll just get get on that. <laughs> Nor, NorCal Danny, yes, I meant third and fourth during regulation, or third and four during regulation. I was like, we got it. Run CMC and it's over. Yeah, you know what? I hear you. Blood Moon says, after seeing Brock Purdy perform in the Super Bowl, does Brock Purdy now carry enough weight to tell Kyle Shanahan to make changes in the game? That is the final key in the evolution for Kyle Shanahan's game. Um, I think so. I like that. I think I think uh, Purdy has a seat at the table. Uh, Gizmo Maltese says in overtime, if KC goes 
first goes first, scores a touchdown, we match. Then Mahomes gets the ball, needing only a field goal, and we lose. If both teams score a touchdown, Kyle's decision is right. Yeah, but you don't play for the third possession there. You don't you play, play for the third possession. You you, you got to go it's for It's a race to finish the game. That's what people right. don't understand about OT. OT is not about possessions. It's not about – it's about – who is going to finish the game first? That's it. It's a race to finish the game. And when you don't take the uh, when you take the ball first, what you're saying is is that you're willing to give up four chances for three. Right. That's it. You're saying sure. I'm going to score in three chances and I know that you're not going to score and the the caveat is is that they thought that it was sudden death. The only reason why you want the ball first is if the first points via a touchdown in the game, but they don't work that way. Well, it's not I don't know that they thought it was sudden, sudden death because they there was dialogue on the sideline that we got a, we were privy to where um, Juice said, you know, if they if they score a touchdown, this game's not over. So I think they understood but the rules. I, no, but, but I feel like Juice, but Juice wasn't asked that. Juice was relaying that to other people. Right. He was telling, he was telling that to his teammates as if to correct them. Like, yo, 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 yo. You do know that scoring a touchdown here does not end the game. They still get the ball, even if we score. And the context in which he was saying it was for clarity's sake, not necessarily. Like, oh, I like the decision that we made. You know what I'm saying? So that's what OT is the first person to win the game. And that's why when we took the ball first and we opted to take three downs instead of four downs, that's why it was confusing. And the only way that you can explain through that is either to say that you didn't know the rules or Kyle's logic. But Kyle's logic is, con is contingent upon or, two things. Or you thought the defense was gassed. Right. Or thank you. Or you thought the defense was gas, but Kyle's logic was already banking on the fact that his team was going to get scored on. He already he already resorted to the fact that they were going to get scored on because he was playing for the third possession. I mean, look at it this way, too. If you have the second possession and the team that gets it first scores a touchdown, then you if you match them and you know, you, as coach uh, as you pointed out, they have four downs now. They know what they need. They got to get a touchdown. If they get the touchdown, they also have the ability to end the game on the two point conversion. I I kind of think that the game winning touchdown was probably their two point conversion play. It was a hundred percent, and that's what the Chiefs said. The Chiefs said, well, not well, not the Chiefs, but Travis Kelsey in his podcast with his brother, he says that even if they would have scored on the first possession. We were going for two to end it. We were going to go for two to end it. So that's that's the crux of overtime. One team doesn't want to be in overtime, and one team does. It forces you to make the decisions in the moment to end the game. So even the Chiefs, the, even our, our, our MO or our mode of thinking on how we were going to go with overtime, if we even stick it with Kyle, what Kyle said, the Chiefs had already had it in their mind that they were going to end it once they got the ball anyway. I, w I would love to have seen the Niners take the ball, score a touchdown, and see how many of the players on their sideline or on the field would have ran Niners on the field. Do you do celebrating, you celebrating like they won? Do you that, know how many people would have ran on the field oh if we would have scored? Do you know how embarrassing that would have been? That would have been so bad, so bad. Yeah, you wouldn't, you would never over, never live that down. Never live um, that down. Laura Taylor, coach, you should be the D line coach. You the man, Larry. Love <laughs> your show. It teaches me a lot. Been a fa been faithful since the early seventies. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Jay Avery. Keep and pay Ayuk. Mahomes would love to get him and laugh once again. B.A. B would be our worst nightmare. He's on. De he's an on-demand player like Beckham. You know, that's a great point. If the Niners don't sign Ayuk, KC is going to get a wide receiver this offseason. Dude, 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 let me tell you something. I, we were talking about B.A. The KC fans were flooding the chat. They want B.A. badly. They but he's not, he's not a free agent. Yeah, he's, he's, so. he's on his fifth-year option. He's on his fifth-year option. There's no way we would not be able to live that down trading B.A. to, 
to the Chiefs. There's just oh, no way. My God. There's a couple of you- teams that I think that he could not be traded to. One, he can't be traded to the Chiefs. Two, he can't be traded to the Raiders. Three, he can't be traded to traded to Seattle. Four, he could not be traded to Houston. Five, there's no way in hell we're giving him the, the commanders. Six, Dallas. He's not going to Dallas. And seven, hell no to Miami. Everywhere else, I would be hurt, but I would understand. Well, but the, the Raiders, go. the Raiders is interesting to me. I would trade him to the Raiders if I got what I wanted. But what he's I a big want, Jaden Daniels fan. If the Raiders, if the Raiders pull off Jaden Daniels, I want to go somewhere with a quarterback. I would, I would, but I want the thirteenth pick. I want one of those second round picks. I think the Raiders may have two. Um, and I want, I want, um, I want that tight end. That I, you know, I'll give you Camla too, but I want Michael Mayer. You want I Michael would, Mayer? I want. I, I would do. I would trade. Ayuk to them for their first Michael Mayer and a day two pick. If they if they would do that, I would do it because I think Michael Mayer out of Vegas and in, in the Niners system could be a great player. Um, mm. And that thirteenth pick could be, as you said, um, you know Latham, and I, I Latham would be nice to have. Um, Patrick says keep or trade Debo and keep or trade Ayuk. I if, if I could, I would tra- I would trade Debo. And keep yeah. Ayuk. I trade Debo and keep Ayuk. But you know what's he worth? Kevin Crittenden. When your rival is the Chimera, Chimera. what does that mean? I'm, I don't know. My I have no idea. Of Mahomes, Reed, Spagnolo. There's no shame in pursuing Belichick. Yeah, I mean, there's no question. I mean, when you know, go for go for the you know go for the best you can get. I mean, Belichick, as I said, would fill two needs for the Niners. He would give Kyle that game manager voice on the sideline and he would provide and the best defensive coordinator in pro football. And I'll say this too. If you could get Belichick, the one guy that I would, the two guys that I would love to see Belichick bring with him would be Josh Ushi and Kyle Duggar. And they're both free agents. So mm-hmm. man, if you could get Belichick and get either one of those guys to follow Belichick here, um, Ushi would give them another rusher. They really miss that speed element off the edge, and he would provide it. And then Duggar, I think, especially with um, you know Afonga having the knee injury, we don't know if, if Afonga is going to be back. You could go with uh, Duggar and and Jair Brown as your safeties next year. Um, just a, just a thought. Uh, third string All Pro. We're in a woke world, Larry. A large white guy is intimidating to most of the woke world. What? It's a whole new day. Come on, dude. So, I, I, you're talking to a guy who's worked in pro football. You're talking to a guy who's spent hours and hours and hours around the players this year. They are not intimidated by anybody. I mean, they're just not. I mean, it's just now maybe exec, maybe Parag is, maybe some you know female executive is, but no, no football player. Is going to be intimidated. Mean Joe Green coached in this league, but Mike Vrabel can't. I mean, come on. I mean, th- there's a lot. There's a lot more intimidating people in the world in the league today. That I mean, Dan Campbell is probably more intimidating than Mike Vrabel. It's not about a gigantic white guy. I just can't believe that. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. It's not you, about a gigantic white guy. It, it just can't be. I mean, and 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 you know, you say it's a woke world. It, it may be a woke world, but it's not a woke locker room. I mean, uh, it's you know, and I don't even know what that even means to be completely honest. I guess I would need it all defined for me. But I don't think that Vrabel is intimidating NFL players. I just don't. Mm-hmm. Where where are you on the intimidation? Because it was such a weird story, Coach. You saw it, I saw it. I but saw I mean, it. it's such a weird. It's a weird thing. So some so in this super physical world of NFL football, Mike Vrabel is too scary to to hire. I don't. I don't know if I buy that. I really don't. Well, I, I believe that the players are different. Uh, uh, you can just look where Mike Vrabel is from. He's comes from probably one of the most traditional coaching trees, um, under coach Belichick. I mean, and coach Belichick is, um, you know, a good coach is right on the border of abuse and fear. 
like a good coach is like right on the border of like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he yeah. hasn't ever hit me, but I think he will. <laughs> like it, it, That's just, that's the, that's the respect. And that's just the bedside manner of some coaches. Some coaches are hard. They tow a hard line. Some coaches want to be your friend. Some coaches want to, uh, they want you to lead while they help they while they facilitate. Um, and I feel like, uh, most players coming into the NFL, NFL coaches are not college coaches. They're not. College coaches, they only deal with you for a finite, a finite amount of time, but they have to give you a lot of attention because you're still a child. So they have to pay attention to your emotional stability. They have to really fake the funk with your family. They got to be able to be able to make sure that you understand what's going on with your home life and your academic life in order to just get you to base level zero to even perform for me with football. Um, in the pros, it's a lot more open. You know, I'm dealing with you as a man and, uh, there, there is no, there, there is no democracy. It's a meritocracy, and it's an autonomy. And I'm the king. And, and you know, it's a dictatorship. Yeah, it's a, I'm it sorry. Is. Yeah, it's a dictatorship, and I'm the king. And you're gonna, you're gonna do what I say, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna contradict myself, and you can't do anything about it. And there's a lot of players that have a problem with it, you know, where they may be afraid and. Coach Rabel comes off like an old school guy who's going to tell you how he feels. That's why you got to ask, you know, do him and Kyle. You can only have one truth teller in the room. You know what I mean? Like you can only have one coach that is kind of unabated. He can say what he wants. He can act the way he wants. And outside of that, you can't have more than one of those guys. There's not one. There's not two Dan Campbell's. <laughs> the, 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 D, staff, the D line, saying? the D line coach is usually dysfunctional. Yes, um, I mean, and most, I, I, most did, teams, the D line coach is a degenerate. I will give I, you that. Did I ever tell you the the Bill Urbanic shit story? No, tell me. Okay. All right, this is an awesome story. All right, so we're sitting in film study during camp, and some guys are nodding off. And he's getting pissed. He's a D-line coach. And this guy, I mean, he called me fuck you, Larry, for the entire season. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is just to put, just to give you guys some perspective. And he's like, he starts telling this story because guys weren't paying attention. And guys were nodding off. And, um, and guys thought that he was being too hard on them. All right? And it was an awesome he goes, let me tell, let me tell you boys about. Uh, let me tell you the shit story. <laughs> and then I'm sitting there. We all kind of, we all kind of like leaned up in our chairs, like, all right, here we go. We're getting the shit story. He goes, there was a squirrel, and he was walking in the forest, and that squirrel was walking along, and along came a big animal. And shit all over that bird. Or shit all over that squirrel. And that squirrel was buried in shit. And he, but yet he was warm and he was comfortable. And then the winter came. And <laughs> that squirrel, he lived because he was covered in shit. But he was warm and he was comfortable. And he survived the winter. And then the springtime came, boys, and guess what happened? He's like, some bird came along and pulled some of that shit off that squirrel. And the squirrel shook loose and said, man, I'm so cool, man. I don't, I'm not buried in shit. And he took five steps, and he got eaten. He got eaten by another animal. And he goes, what's the moral of the story, boys? And I'm like, I have no idea. Nobody's raising their hand. Everybody's laughing. And he goes, here's the moral of the story. People that shit on you aren't necessarily your friends. And people that take shit off your back aren't necessarily, or aren't necessarily your enemies. And people that take shit off your back aren't necessarily your friends. So just remember, if you're warm and you're comfortable, sit there and shut the fuck up. Oh my god, dude. Oh my god. 
It was just epic. It was just epic. All these guys were just like, yeah, yeah. Did that hit? Oh, it hit. It hit because basically what he was saying is, hey, I'm crapping on you. We're, we're going through practice film, and I'm telling you where you're fucked up. And I'm telling you why you're fucked up on this play and how you're screwed up on that play and what you did wrong here and what you did wrong there. But guess what? I'm, sh- I'm crapping on you, but I'm your friend. I'm trying to make you better. Mm-hmm. There may be somebody in this world that's just going to kiss your butt and tell you how great you are, but they ain't necessarily your friend. You know, they're not, and they ain't making you better. And they're not, in other words, most players can understand the difference between, hey, man, he's yelling at me because he hates me, or he's yelling at me to make me better so I can be better, so I can make more money for my family. And at the end of the day, that's what NFL players are about. They're about, I'll take whatever verbal abuse is coming my way. If you can make me a better football player so I can make more money for my family. And that was really it. And he was centering on that, uh, with his, with his S story. Um, but I'll tell you, it, it's, you know, you know, there's a lot of different ways to motivate and it's, you know, it's, I've seen, um, guys motivate through humor. I've seen guys motivate through fear. I've seen guys motivate through just pure intellect. There's a lot of different ways to get across to a to a room full of of um, you know players. Your mm-hmm. point, and um, I know I I think Vrabel. I think you know this wall came back because we were talking about Vrabel. Uh, All right, Vrabel is intimidating, but you know I think he would get their attention. I think he would get players' attention, and I think it's ultimately if you're substantive as a coach, um, you're going to get their attention. If you're not, then you're just not. Um, well, Terradome just put something out that I uh, that I absolutely love is the AAU kids. He said the AAU kids can't handle it, and that and, and it really is coming down. I mean, you know, shit rolls downhill. Like the AAU, kind of like the era, the AAU era, the 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 travel team era, um, the training with NFL skill sets at 13 years old, learning how to lift college programs at 16 years old um you know teaching technique and you know there's some you know there used to be a time where like man you was born into being an o-lineman remember those days like you just had to get bigger and then once you actually showed the size that you could play o-line then you actually got put into the weight room and they started actually working with your body because we actually knew what you were going to be now you know, you got kids that are training to be old linemen at like 13. It's like this kid, kid ain't even had a wet dream yet. This, you don't even know if that's baby fat. Sitting here teaching this kid kick steps and gallop techniques. You know, I, I just feel like when you watch the NFL today, you're starting to see a lot of that stuff that we thought was kind of ridiculous in the early 2000s. You're starting to see it on the NFL now where you get kids where they had trainers all their life. You know, very rarely do you get the kid that just started playing football five years ago and kind of turned himself into something and got into the league. Like there used to be stories like that all over the place in football where it was really the the cream rising to the top. Right. It was about talent. But now you get all these dudes that are curated for the position. They ain't never played both ways in their life. They're not multi-sport athletes. All they've been doing is playing football and they look like it because the stuff that we want to see on the field isn't football specific it's sports specific playing into the whistle always having effort playing into the last down making sure like that is not a football centric edict that's something that you learn from playing both ways that's something that you learn from playing football and basketball and wrestling and baseball you know, like, so what you're seeing today now, even not in the football, but just in today's athlete, you're starting to see like a different caliber of kid. It's a different kid that you're watching play today. Um, And, you know, it's and, and what works to motivate somebody doesn't work to motivate the next guy. I mean, it's just the way it is. Metal Monk says rumor has it Vrabel walks through the locker room body slamming players into their lockers just to keep them on their toes. Eh, good. Sounds like the kind of guy that I'd like to have. Um, 
yeah, no, I, to me, I can't. I doubt that's true. Alien D. Jin said, this is my favorite pod of the week. How are we going to survive without football? Are you kidding me? We Coach only got 20 weeks, man. Football's Coach. not going anywhere. I, I'm chomping at the, I'm tired. But camp starts in August. It's February. We got 20 weeks. Hold out. Draft's oh, going to happen. Free agency. Then we'll be right back in the saddle. I'm all over the draft. I'm already all over the draft, and and mm -hmm. I'm going to be all over free agency, and I got a question for Coach on free agency. But we'll be here for you every Saturday throughout the offseason and chopping it up and doing what we do. So, uh, Alien D. Jin, thank you for saying this is uh, your favorite pod of the week. It's one of my favorites as well. And, um, dude, Coach Coach, and I uh, love doing it, and we've done it consistently for the for most of this year, and we'll continue to in the offseason. Anthony Lope says, here's a 10 spot. Thank you, Anthony. Bloodman says, any realm um, we trade B.A. and get Marvin Harrison Jr.? Yeah, that's a pipe dream. No. Yeah, that, yeah he's gone, gone. He's he's going to go one or two. Anthony yeah. Lope says, if Malik Neighbors is there at eight with Atlanta on the clock, trade Ayuk in our first. I do love Malik Neighbors from Malik LSU. Malik Neighbors is nice. He's fast. He's 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 yeah. nice. He's he's give you he'd give you that vertical threat. He's my favorite receiver in the draft. Jeff says, Larry, thanks for the Graham Barton report. We need him. Uh Duke. Duke offensive tackle guard. I don't know though if he's a I he might be he's definitely not a left tackle. He might mm -hmm. be a right tackle, but I think he might just be a guard. Uh Chimera equals a three headed beast. Look at that. Kevin Crittenden. All right. Um two last ones before we go. Mm -hmm. One, um, there's an interesting article. There's a lot of interesting articles out right now about, you know, who the Niners can cut and, um, you know, who the who's, you know, who's um, like, here we go. Four potential. Rohan wrote an article for potential cut candidates, and his four are Hughes check, um, Isaiah Oliver, Jake Brendel and Colton McKivitz. Um, I don't know that McKivitz makes enough. Nah. To cut him, I think they'll keep McKivitz. He, My I guess say, is, why would you cut him? Yeah, I think Oliver and Hughes check for sure. Yeah, I, and I know Hughes check's gonna go. I mean, he was he was nowhere to be found. Um, it's time to let it's time to let the 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 league's most expensive fullback go. We can find something else. Yeah, I'll tell you the guy that I would be intrigued by because there aren't a lot of fullbacks out there. But just looking at the free agent market. I think the Niners may be able to sign Noah Fant, the former Iowa tight end, and mm. let use him as a fullback. Um, I don't think there, there's not a lot of fullbacks, period. So uh, a guy like Fant, I think, you know, could be a, kind of a backup tight end slash fullback. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense to me. Um, okay, so there's an article that I read about cap casualties and guys who around the league, they had 20 names. Here are the names. Russell Wilson, Nick Chubb, Jimmy Garoppolo, Mike Williams, David Bakhtiari, Alvin Kamara, Hassan Reddick, who you brought up before, Tyler Lockett, Devondre Campbell, Xavier Howard, who I like, uh, Hunter Renfro, Jamal Adams, Kevin Byard. And then they have two last ones, Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa. What do you think of letting go of Farrell and Chase Young and Randy Gregory? And seeing if you can go sign Joey Bosa. He's 28. Uh, he's 6'5, about 275, 280. So he's definitely a bigger bodied guy. The Niners like that. Uh, he's only played in 14 games over the last two seasons. He's only had nine sacks combined over the last two seasons. So he's not been healthy, um, which is why the Chargers, you know, if you're going to, if the Chargers are going to bring back one, it's probably Khalil Mack. Why? Mm -hmm. Because Mack's, Mack had 17 sacks this year. So if they decided to cut Joey Bosa, and the Chargers are $45.8 million over the cap, fourth worst cap situation in the league. The Niners are over the cap, but only by $3.7 million. What do you think? Would uh, Joey Bosa um, take less to play with his brother? Uh, would you be interested in Joey Bosa, Coach, as a replacement for you know Gregory, Chase Young, what do you think? Where are you on Joey um, Bosa? He's always hurt. I mean, been hurt I, know, a lot. I know he ain't coming over here if we hire uh, if we hire Coach Stefanski. 
He does have a better. This guy makes Dusty says, "Hey, he's got a better motor than Chase." Yeah, he's got a better motor, but he is injury prone. He's injury prone. Uh, and you know, it would be asking him what type of money are we going to be paying you? I mean, shit, take some of your brothers. Like you, it's all in the family. Um, on its face, I would say no. Um, I I would want some more youth there. Uh, I understand that Drake Jackson has been sat down for the whole year, but it's time for him to, you know, put up or shut up, see what we can do with him. You know, this is pretty much his swan song. If he doesn't handle business, uh, we got Brad, um, not Bradley bill, but we got Robert bill. See what Robert bill is going to give us down the line. Um, Spencer Wiggy is still on the, uh, the, um, the roster. Uh, I think that if we're going to go get another guy, if you wanted to, if you wanted to like make a splash, yeah. But I think Hassan Reddick is better than Joey Bosa. He's definitely more consistent. The only thing is, is don't they want Hassan Reddick's in that 230, 240 range? It seems like the Niners they want somebody that can do both, right? Stop the running. It just seems the like they they want guys that are in that 270 range. Yeah, I just I don't know, man. Like. He just he's always hurt, man. He is always hurt. Um, I don't I just don't like the move. I really don't. Um, okay. What do you think of, of what do you think of this one? Tell Tej Beat says get Brian Burns, who's a free agent, or trade Ayuk for Patrick Sertan. I like trading Ayuk for Patrick Sertan. I like the idea of getting a number one corner. I like the idea of getting a number one corner. I'm really not that bad about you, Tez. You've been blowing me the whole show, too, but I'm not mad at you. I'll give credit where credit is due. Um, but uh, I don't know about um, – who's the first guy he mentioned? Well, Sertan. Sertan. Are you Sertan or who else? He mentioned well, two. He, did he? I don't know. I don't see it here. He said Burns. Burns, Brian Burns. I think Brian Burns is a is a is a pipe dream too. He's a free agent. He's gonna want a lot of money. He's gonna want he's gonna want Nick Bosa money. There's no way. Yeah. That doesn't seem like um No, Brian Burns know. is uh that's pie in the sky stuff. He's like uh you you get like a Brian Burns. We already have a Brian Burns. His name is Nick Bosa. Like as far as the money is concerned. I like love Sertan. I love Sertan because I really think that when you have true number one dominating corners, there's so many things you can do. I mean, defensively, a, if with Sertan and with Sertan, Diamador Lenore and Traverius Ward, we instantly had the best quarterback cornerback trio in the league. Right there, like with those three. Then with Huff and Jair Brown coming back, I would say sign like another another like pace horse guy in uh in um Tashawn Gibson. I, Eddie Jackson just got let go by Chicago. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Something like that. A guy that's savvy that could play one high back there. And uh I would love that. That would shore up all of our secondary issues and it would help our linebacking core. Really, if we're gonna get a big time free agent. In my opinion, like if there was a big free agent we were going to go get, I want us to run it back and go get Aziz. I would not be mad at paying him big time money. I to agree. Go get Aziz Al Shair. Like, stop playing. He needs to be back. We let him go, and he actually played his the true Mike position in Tennessee, and he showed what he is. He proved that he's one of the best linebackers in the league. Uh, Aziz leaving hurt our defense tremendously, particularly in the run game. We need Aziz back on top of Dre is not going to be back at best until Christmas. And then we don't even know what he's going to be by the time we get him back. And we don't even know what will what we're going to be, what we'll be as far as the season is concerned. I, if there was ever somebody that I would not mind if we spent the money to go get him with this little bit of money that we have right now, go get Aziz Ashair. Go get I him. agree. No, I totally agree. Um, I agree because one, you're you don't want to change your culture. He's 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 really popular. And it doesn't guy matter in the Tennessee. He's a free agent. He's a open to the big, he's he's open to any bidder. So yeah. Tennessee does not have Tennessee. They don't. They, I don't care if they want him or not. They should have signed him during the season. So they messed up. He's out there. Okay, two names that are kind of that I got to throw you as far as defense coordinators. 
Um, people, you know, have a bunch of different candidates out there. Somebody um, said that Green Law is going to start week one. No. What? <laughs> He's got, an Achilles, he's got an Achilles. That Somebody he, flame him. We get flamed up here. Somebody flame Harry Ballsback. Because he's out of his Ballsback mind. Yeah, that's get nuts. What is he going to, what are they going to take him to Lourdes and dip him in holy water? I mean, <laughs> what, what, what are we talking about? I mean, that, he's going to be ready for week one. You know, I mean, it's like these, this, this injury used to be like a career ender. Now you're not, you're not even going to miss even. Any time at all, you're just no, you know what it is. Sometimes people be so pressed to just disagree with us that they don't even fact check their own logic. They're just like, he'll be back by week one. What the hell is he talking about? It's like, how, how is he going to be back by week one? You know who's an interesting name to me is Chris Kiffin because mm -hmm. Chris Kiffin is the linebacker coach at Houston. He's been a coordinator before. He's tight with Aziz. He's the reason the Niners got Aziz to begin with. Maybe Chris Kiffin as your D coordinator and he gets Aziz coming back. Maybe yeah. Vrabel, maybe Vrabel as your DC and he gets Aziz, Aziz. made Aziz made a, an appearance during the playoffs. He came in, he came and hyped up the boys with the linebacker court. He's still very attached to his boys. I'm telling you, man, we can write that wrong. It's time for yeah. us to stop. He's not, this isn't like letting Kendrick Bourne go get signed, right? This isn't that. This isn't like letting DJ Jones walk, all right? Like, we kind of really messed up by letting Aziz Ashair walk. Good linebackers are very hard to come by, especially that can run and to defend the pass. We need to get him back. We yeah. need to get him back. Because no we don't even know what Dre is going to be once he gets back. Right, right. Um, I, I They do have Jalen Graham and D. Winters, but I would like to see Aziz yeah, back. I ain't Brian, trying to get all that shit. Brian uh -huh. B. says, I'd like to try out Tim Ryan. Take him down out of the booth. That guy knows a lot about offense and defense, and he's a tough guy. I like T-Rock a lot, but come on, man. You're not popping out of the booth. And I know I realize he played in the NFL, but um, – I'd be he's more on easy street, man. That's way too much work for less money. Yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, he's he, you know, when you're working, the kind of Timmy's a great guy, and mm -hmm. me and Tim are good friends. But if you've got a if you got a plum media job, and you've got a family and a life, it's so much better than the hours the coaches work. The hours the coaches work, these guys show up at. 5 a.m. They're there till midnight. They do it all season long and most of the year. And then the only time they're really not working those crazy hours, so a little bit in the off season, they'll dial it down to like they're showing up at seven and they're leaving at seven. But I mean, we're talking about 12 hour days in the off season. They're only the only coaching break you get is between the last mini camp and training camp. So you're talking about they're going to vacation a little bit in June. That's it. The rest of the year, it's an 11 month deal of hundred hour weeks. I don't think Tim's up for that. I really don't. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think he's up for that. Um, and 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 if you said to me, you could have Tim Ryan, you could, what you know on your team, on your staff, where do you want him to do? I want him to be Daryl Tap. I want him to be um, the assistant D-line coach to Chris Kosarek. He's a D-lineman who knows D-line technique, and he could man that Daryl Tapp role as being the assistant D-line coach. Well, you know but we need it. Daryl Tapp but, is gone. Yeah, but you're not making Tim Ryan the defensive coordinator. I mean, you're just not. Um, all right, Coach, uh, final thought. I'll let you, uh, if there's anything that we haven't covered that you want to cover, I'll give you the your final uh, final thought before we call it a stream we're two hours and 22 minutes into it uh thanks to pig and a pickle thanks to underdog fantasy thanks to uh, marin autoglass and thanks to our our brand new sponsors this month sharp corner sports cards and collectibles and valleyhillroofing.net all of the links are in the description but and 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 by the way uh if everybody could um, you know, give us a like and a subscribe. That always helps the channel. It helps Coach's channel help mine as well. Hell yeah. The, the links to uh, to the sponsors are in the description. Please like and subscribe to the Krug Show. Please like and subscribe to Coach's channel as well. But you got a final thought, Coach? Uh, yeah, man. Hey, man. As you start the next week coming up and you don't think 
that there's a lot going on in between now and the when the season starts. Use this time to get better. Master the mundane. The little things that you let slip during the season that you necessarily weren't paying attention to. Use this time to regroup, reset, get away from football. Go get, go read a book, go paint, go hunt, go do something. Come back with a fresh new perspective and a new view on this team because that's the only way you get better. You got to put it down for a while. You can't white knuckle it the whole way through. Yep. So, hey, man, live a little. We'll see you in the draft, man. Um, we will be here every Saturday, unless coach, unless coach can't make it. I will be here every Saturday, coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're going to keep doing our thing, but I agree with coach. Um, dude, I put everything I had into this football season. I grinded like I would grind if I was scouting for a team. I, I put everything I had into the channel. I put everything I had into the season, into these streams, into the videos, into, mm-hmm. um, you know, just everything. And this week has been a hard week because it's just been kind of like, oh, you know, and I'm coaching Little League now, and so I've been dealing with that. And, uh, and you know, I'm excited to be working with my boy. But um, And my other kid made the varsity baseball team at Northgate, so I'm happy for him. My second boy and, and Kev's, you know, obviously Kev and I have huge plans to grow this channel. Um, and we're going to do a lot of baseball. We're going to do basketball. Uh, we're going to start doing some Warrior Post games. I'll start doing some giant stuff as well. But obviously my main focus is going to be the draft. And um, and going forward, we're going to produce tons of content. Um, yeah. I, I started this channel um, about... Uh, almost a year ago, almost two years ago, I should say. Um, it was March 1st of 2022, and it is February the 17th of 2024. And we're sitting here at 39,089 subs. So thanks to all of you guys. Um, we've had almost 5 million views of our content this month. We picked up over almost 5,000 subscribers in the last in the last month, over 415,000 watch time hours, and and I just want to thank all you guys because it's been it's been a labor of love, but it's been awesome. Um, and MF says I love this channel. I appreciate that. MA Duran says thank you both for your sacrifices. Oh no, dude, it, it, we're, we've been having a lot of fun. I mean, we've been having a lot of fun. And yeah, we'll we've been stepping away, man. This is kind of a collaborative thing, like. Even with even with the supporters um, in the show, I kind of feel like I'm talking to the same people. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like this is kind of a group where we all get back together. And one thing that I'm proud of is that we've been contentious. We've gone back and forth, but we've always held a level of decency and respect as men. And I feel like we found common ground outside of football that allows us to be as controversial and to rub up against each other in football because we know what type of people we are. As we know, I know you as a person, you know, you respect the man that I am and I respect the man that you are. So it's been a great experience and I wouldn't, I, I would have never um, expected this. I'm, I'm truly blessed. I'm privileged for all of the people that have followed my channel through your channel, you know, and uh, it's been awesome. It's been a great year. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, man. I Seriously, really am. I, I am as well, um, and and the streams have gotten better and better and better, and that's why the coaches' stream on this channel has been has been probably one of our best streams all week, every week, because he brings it. Uh, as he said, we've we've got we've kind of uh, we've banged heads, we've gone at each other, uh, but we kind of know who each other is at this point, and I yeah. think we produced some really, really good content in the last, uh, you know, let's say six, or seven, eight weeks. I think it's been as good as anything I've ever done. Brother Bob says, bang, bang, man, I love your work. Um, Thank you, guys. We got this one from Whale and Wasp. He said, Krug Show is my go-to for 49er content. Appreciate you. Um, M.A. Duran says, Sub- uh, subscribed. Appreciate you. Uh, MF has got a Giants question. He says, "Does Dave Rigetti bring good knowledge to the still to the Giants? Why hasn't Farhan brought him in before?" He absolutely does. He absolutely does. And uh, Dave's a 
you know, he's been a starter. He's been a reliever. He'll be in Giants camp a lot this summer or this spring. So that's a good thing. Uh, Bronson says, love the fire you brought today, coach. Yeah, Thanks, I man. do too. Thank Seriously. you, guys. Good stuff. Um, anyway. Hey, thanks to everybody. Um, have a great rest of your Saturday. Um, I will uh, take tomorrow off, but we will be streaming uh, in our regular spots all next week, starting Monday morning. And uh, for the coach, I'm Larry. Have a great Saturday, everybody. Peace. Yeah, never met a man I've been scared of. Careful, you won't